No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today I'm in here, long anticipated interview with Blasi. What up, what up? How you feeling, you? man? Feeling really good right now. It's nice to have you in here, man. I was watching the, the Trevor interview that he did with you on the VBC. Mm-hmm. If anybody wants to get deeper after this or before this, then go check that out. But yeah, it was a very good entry point to me, kind of like understanding you on a deeper level. And it was it was kind of trippy watching you guys talk about No Jumper and shit because it was like, you guys were acting like I probably wasn't going to see this. Like you didn't yeah, say that, sure. but like you're, you're, you're not yeah. like thinking I'm going to see it. So you're like talking about me. It was like a weird window into like seeing people talk about the behind the closed doors almost because you're so used to people talking about it in ways that they know you're going to see. Mm-hmm. So they kind of like, you, you don't really know if you should trust it or not. Exactly. Exactly. I'm starting to sec. What did I say? Did I say like, man, fuck no jumpers. Nah. <laughs> But it were like it, it was interesting hearing your perspective on the uh, the the No Jumper show near Fallout that mm-hmm. happened at one point. I was like, wow, he like knows more about this than me. And then yeah. also even like you just talking about like fucking with No Jumper when you're younger and like I don't know. Oh was, no, yeah, I've trippy. been I've been watching this shit since like 2015. I always reference this one specific like like drip review you did back then, but House never remembers it. I just remember there was like viral like Goku Versace shirts at the because time because that was an ain't nobody cool design. Probably, and they yeah. made like a billion dollars off that. I just remember it was like the the weirdest, craziest thing in the underground. And then you just saw it at the mall two years later. Oh, really? They, st- they I guess they did do that at the no, mall too. In the context of like they just got bootlegged. Oh, they bootlegged the, mall. the bootleg. Really? Yeah, they were popular. Those wow. shirts. That's crazy. But that was my introduction of uh, No Jumper for sure. Really? I, yeah, I think I saw it like on Facebook, and I'm like, oh. I wonder if we did like a a drip review where I showed that item before I knew the Ain't Nobody Cool guys. Well, I don't think so though, because before I even was doing No Jumper, I knew Ain't Nobody Cool, yeah. and I remember they that was like their popping graphic at the I time. I just remember the context where like you were like in an apartment building or something like that. Yeah. And you pulled it out of a bin. I don't know. I used to live in this janky ass house in Koreatown, and Damn. all the fucking dirtball dudes that I was living with like wouldn't lock the doors when we would leave. Uh-huh. So then, like, I would get home and just realize that the house was just completely open all day, and these fucking assholes are just like putting all my possessions at risk. <sighs> but luckily, nothing ever happened. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't be able to do that. My sanity wouldn't be able to exist in there. You never lived in a flop house. Uh, a flop house, not specifically, but I had had a couple of roommates that lasted like a week, just them just chilling on my couch and, you know, like, fr- f- like before you do it, it's like, oh, this is a dream, you know, yeah, you could sleep over every night, bro, pull up, right. smoke up, and then you realize three days later, like, fuck, I want to really chill in my living room with this girl, and this guy's just like taking a nap right now. Like, my, the, there's such extremes with like how you can choose to live when yeah. you're like a young person, right? Because I've done the thing where I like had an apartment with like one other dude and he was like a straight laced business dude and he's up at 7 30 in the morning every day and he's getting home from work at 6 p.m and then he's got to be in bed by 11 and like it's weird because like you're adjacent to this super normal lifestyle yeah and then on the other hand i've had like bmx flop houses where maybe it's like me and like five six seven eight other dudes living there and then we also like on average would have four or five dudes sleeping on the couches in the living room and you really start to almost feel like your house is like a public yeah park where it sounds like, like anyone f- could just post up at it sounds like a frat house without a uh, college involved yeah like my girl said even when she met me that she like went back to my house and thought that i was gonna like i had kind of presented myself to her as if i like really had my shit together and then she goes to the house and it's like filthy fucking yeah. <laughs> mattress on the floor disgusting fucking setup right no rea- uh bringing girls to your crib is definitely a reality check you're like fuck my, my shit definitely ain't that clean as i thought it was i know but and the, uh, but, but there's like so many girls where it doesn't matter doesn't but yeah. then you kind of like go for a chick who's a little bit higher up there right and then she sees your crib and like you realize that you're a piece of shit and that her viewpoint on you is like more important than your own viewpoint on yourself <laughs> yeah that's where i've been <laughs> no it definitely gets there for sure definitely um okay so were you going to like ham on everything parties and all that yeah. kind of shit in like the 2013 14 ish era literally i graduated high school like 2013 and right off the bat i think that summer there was a, a 
It was an Ethel Wolf shout out to House Phone. <laughs> it was an Ethel Wolf uh, Little Debbie show Oof. in like on fucking Seventh Street or something like that. Wow! And I did that a couple of times. I went to the parties on Manchester. You know mm-hmm. those were fun. Um, but you know what? I'd never really met House Phone out there. But I did meet a lot of his like his high school homies. Like I was cool with them. It was weird. Okay. Yeah. When I met House Phone, he was really like I only met him because he had like seen the podcast and he like wanted to do coke with me. Really? And he just had coke and he's like, you want you you want to keep up? And I was just like, yeah. And he, he got it all like on his nose and shit. He got like a big white powdery cloud on his face. <laughs> That's crazy. Shit. That's probably some shit. Like if you walk into like a 2022 hand party, like there's still going to be that kid out. Yo, I'm 22. I, bump. I honestly can't even imagine what going to that type of party at this point in my life would be like. I would yeah. feel so old, so weird. It's just, I don't know. Just it wouldn't the, sit right with my soul. Yeah, just the flavor of the week, just performing two songs and shit. I would feel so out of my fucking depths. Do they do ham band. on everything anymore? I think they stopped for the whole pandemic, and maybe they're getting back to it now, but I don't think I've actually seen any flyers for, like, actual events. Yeah, it's been a couple, like, different, like, groups that have occupied that, like, weird underground space. Yeah. Shout out to Rare House is one of them. People who are willing to take the risk of doing parties where you, like, clearly don't have insurance right. or any kind of exactly. security or anything facts because i used to look at that shit as being so lit and now i look at it as like that's lit but it's also scary exactly to me as a businessman and on top of that you're not on like fucking melrose or like on rodale drive you're like in the hood and like the industrial district of downtown you know yeah. what i mean where it's just just sketchy bums looking for copper and like fucking rave girls and shit or like i don't know what hood occupied that manchester spot but definitely like we were just going to parties getting insanely fucked up in the middle of a real area where there's definitely people holding down that block who might not be happy about you being there Mm -hmm. definitely interesting space all the girls with blue hair and mascara streaked down their face just parading around the streets to the gas station and shit that was the time I swear to God. You getting fucked up at those parties and shit, too? You doing drugs back then? No, I mean, I've never really been, like, a drug kind of guy. People think I am. People think I'm, like, in the corner, like, doing shit. I think you are, too, because you're always talking about different psychedelics you've done. (laughs) When we went to Vegas, you were fucked up on lean before we even got there, and you slept until... Okay, let me me explain that. Let me explain that. So, look, a couple people in the comments were like, I'm so disappointed. But the truth is, is, like, I know when to truly separate working from chilling. Mm. And if I have an off day where it's like, dude, you don't have to do anything for 14 hours necessarily. It's not like a critical phone call or some Mm. graphic you got to send over tonight. I'm going to have fun. Right. But like whether it's like 4 p.m. on like a busy Thursday, like fuck all that. But from my perspective with lean and to a certain extent with pills in general, like it always seems like a fun idea. And then when you actually do it, it makes you tired. And that's just not that good because everybody else has like a normal amount of energy. And then you're fucked up. And everybody's like if you hang out with a bunch of other people who are getting fucked up like you, it might not stand out so much. But yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like I think I surround myself with like. I th- I'm, I'm the only one who like smokes like blunts at my office and I have like a team of like seven people You're the only one? Yeah, no, I mean three guys just don't even smoke weed One guy will like hit, hit a joint every now and then they're right. just exclusively dabs But like like almost uh, not everyone but like more than half of the people here smoke weed Right a yeah. large percentage of the day. Oh, yeah, no, it's definitely sick But like, you know, that's kind of the environment that encourages me to, to stay straight and like i said even when i was surrounded with a bunch of like dudes that are just nodded off all day it's like i always made sure to like separate work from fucking enjoyment mm. um but that, that that's definitely a big factor what i do you got that's for anything i've seen you've seen so many rappers just fall off because they gave into drugs and you know what i mean it's so easy to uh to say yes when the four's right in front of you you know but like if, if you're if you're locked in in an office where fucking no one even has weed, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be around a lot of, I guess, positive uh, reinforcements. But do you think that, <clears throat> would you rather hire somebody who doesn't smoke weed or would you rather hire somebody who does kind of get I, fucked up? Shit. You know, I'm always down the pass of blunt. We could smoke all day. Because with my designer homies, we'd be blowing gas all day long. But as far as like hiring, like we were just talking about it uh, at my trip. It's like, you know, I could never hire like a pill head or lean head. Like no. me personally... Like not at this that's point why in my life. Th- that's why I made the say no to fentanyl shit. I cannot work with somebody that's off perks. Like right. pill heads, I can't do. Right. I'll, I'll see. I'll see you on the weekend, but <laughs> you know what I mean. I can't. I can't see you Monday through Friday. There's nothing going on. And when I think about like that era that we're talking about, like 2012, 13, 14, when I was like really 
going to shows, going to parties in LA, thought it was the sickest shit, thought that it was so cool to get to be around somebody like Lil Debbie or whoever, you know, like yeah. so easily impressed by like the most minute amount of stardom that when I look back at it, I'm just like, oh my God, that is so fucking cringe. Yes. Just cause now I'm so used to it that like, bro, I just like met Paul Wall and it didn't really like take me out of character at all. It was just like, you know, Paul, which granted he's like the most like humble, low key, cool ass right. dude ever. But he got, but he's a legend. He's been famous as fuck to me since high school. You know, right. like it's like that's like twenty years or some shit that that this guy was like a big deal to me, and I didn't even trip at all. Like I felt like I was somebody I had already met because I had talked to him online a little bit in the DMs and stuff. But back then, I was so enamored by like little bits of clout. Why do you think that is though? Do you think that like we've just seen the expansion of like micro micro niche celebrities online or? You know, because back then it's like you really think about famous people. Mm. It's probably like 500. Is there, you know, 2,600 nowadays? But I think you know I just I mean? have gotten numb to it, but just <clears throat> meeting famous people over yeah. and over and over. To, but because at, at that time it was like I had been in BMX for so long. And the thing in BMX is that like it's really, really hard to see out of it. It mm -hmm. is its own little world. It's its own community, just like skating is or whatever. But then to reach out of that and to be able to fuck with people who are like genuinely famous or even like an underground rapper to me was really, really famous at that time because mm -hmm. we hadn't really been exposed to that. So it just seemed like such a big deal to me. And, you know, at that time, I like, but well, okay, what I was going to say about that era yeah. is that I just, when I look at that, I'm like, wow, I was really not taking my life serious at all. Like, <laughs> my goal was like, go out and party and get fucked up. Yeah. And now my goal is like to take care of this business and like make content. And I feel like I have all these responsibilities and Facts. shit. And like those same people that I thought it was totally normal to be around now, it, I would be like appalled at the shit right. that they're doing because I am holding myself to a standard of like wanting to get shit done every day. Exactly. And back then it's like, you know, cause prior to hand, what was there? You know what I mean? So you always had to like kind of check in and you know, you gotta be fascinated by the little Debbies. But once you're down to your like 10,000th, like micro celebrity you meet, right. Kind of do almost do get jaded. Do you ever get like nervous? Like in 2022, still doing interviews like with people, it would there's take someone a lot. That'll, that'll get you shaky. Yeah, but it would take a lot. You yeah. know, it would just have to be somebody like a really big deal and they would have to be really intimidating. Yeah, like some Jay Z shit or past yeah, that. Yeah, be because it's like, I mean, I, I, Mike Tyson just popped into my head because he's like the such a famous motherfucker. Oh, he had Boosie fucking Bad shit. motherfucker, <laughs> tough as motherfucker, but would I feel intimidated? Would I feel nervous to interview him? I don't really think so because he seems very down to earth. Yeah. You know? And I feel like that would like stop me from stressing out about it. Huh. I get more stressed about the rappers where their like personality fluctuates like crazy, right. you know? That yeah, no, for sure. Rappers are so drama queens. So you, you get out of high, well, I, I guess we, we got to start from the beginning, like yeah. a little bit. Like when when did you identify that you were really this creative person, like in your childhood? When did it start to stand out to you, like oh, I'm I'm a creator, whether you honed in on those words I or think, not? I think is really you know there's levels to it. You know, I, I think everyone has that moment in first or second grade where they learn about Legos and they spend the next fucking three years on it. And uh, I, I think that kind of like, you know, like sparked the, the flame of creativity. I mean, you know, it went from me just being fascinated with how to make buildings. And, you know, it was just a bunch of like kid shit up until about ninth, 10th grade. And mm -hmm. that's when I started doing uh, uh, stuff like flyers for all the homies. You know, like where I'm from, it's a lot of uh, uh, like ska bands, punk bands, metal bands. Right. And, uh, and you were just drawing or were you already doing graphic design shit on the computer? I mean, I was the kid that drew in middle school, but like 9th, 10th grade came around. I downloaded paint. You know what I mean? I started associating myself with that. And there, there's people who are starting to get recognized, especially in like the metal community. There's a lot of people who are doing like the craziest fucking text and shit like you that. You were doing those kind of logos? I was trying to. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, like hardcore and like deathcore, all that shit, like it, it, it. Sir, it lives in Southeast LA. A lot of people mm. love that shit out there. And you know, when I think about those flyers and shit, sometimes it feels like those flyers are like the last of a dying breed in the sense that <laughs> yeah. graphic design now is so often like based on something that predicates it. Like there's always like an example that you can go to or like you start working on a t-shirt design and like almost always you sort of find another t-shirt design or another right. font that you can compare it to. Mm -hmm. But like so much of those hardcore flyers is like hand drawn or just like janky ass letters or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's a more professional streak to it these days, but there is like something about that shit. Yeah, no, I mean, it was for sure. I mean, everyone in middle school fucking tried to do the Metallica logo on their fucking binder. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it kind of just stemmed from that and then just 
it grew into doing uh, uh, you know flyers and all that, and then you know street art and then cover art. But it's interesting to me because were you like always interested in like where did your interest really gravitate? Because you're observing all these subcultures, whether it's ska or, or punk or fucking metal or whatever you said, mm-hmm. and then also. But you you gravitate towards the graphic design side of things, which is really interesting to me because a lot of people might like go for the more obvious side of that, or it's yeah. like they want to be in the band or whatever. Was, was there something about design that always stood out to you that this is what's the really fact, important to me? The fact that it's computer and you could really pace it, you know, with music, like, dude, music's my first love. Like, mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you were to ask me what I was going to do at 16, I would have been like, oh, I'm going to play piano. I'm, I'm going to be a rapper. You know what I mean? Then you start figuring, like, I'm not really as, like, composed as I thought I was on guitar. Or, like, you know, my <laughs> voice sounds hella, my voice sounds hella nasally. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't sound good under boom bat rap. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? And I, I, you just get in where you fit in. You know, you start realizing, oh, I can do Photoshop. You know, I'm not in this dude's band or anything, but shit, I got y'all on the flyer. You know, mm. and then their friend tells their friend. Right. But what was your goal with that at the time? Did you see a future in it? Or was it just like, oh, I'm just going to do this at this moment because this seems cool? Were you even getting I, paid? I, yeah, for sure wasn't getting paid till like after high school. Um, the whole time, I, I mean, it's just you know everyone's in the band not making any money at all either. So it's just you, you know, everyone wants to feel like they're playing a role and they got a hat on, mm-hmm. and that was kind of like my way of uh, fulfilling that. Yeah, because um, with hardcore and shit, like a lot of times the shows are so cheap, the merch is so cheap, everything yeah. is so cheap that it's like the bands barely make money. Like hardcore, like when I was into it, like shirts were ten bucks. Yeah, and I don't think that's changed that much i'm sure there's probably like 15 and shit a lot of times i think what really stifles is just like their culture and the fact that like dude we don't fucking make money over here you got me fucked up we're 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 living in a van and we're all dealing with it you do too right you know i and i didn't really think about a single dollar all throughout high school be honest with you right you know it was just pure creativity it was just fun and just trying it you know i mean it wasn't anything where it's like oh blazzy the uh, flyer guy it was just like once every three months you know in between me skateboarding and doing bullshit you know what i mean you weren't tempted to get in the streets uh i mean and shit there was a lot of vices in middle school but like they really like drill that that whole uh, uh dare shit in uh la mm. schools especially in, like by like first second grade they're, they're giving us like pamphlets and coloring books of like gang members like being strung out or being arrested really or, so they're going hard to make you not do that shit yeah yeah no wow. they really did it and uh you know it came to a point where it's like you know, my, my homies in middle school, they ended up being like gangbangers and like really repping their hoods. And, you know, it, it kind of all started from skateboarding. You know mm. what I mean? I think like th- that's where the crossroads are at for like metalheads and like uh, like cholos and shit like that is skateboarding. And, you know, from there, I decided just keep skateboarding. All my homies, though, they decided to be tag bangers and rep their hoods and shit like that. But I, didn't, I, I wasn't too interested in that, though. What was it? Because like, you know, we always talk about what drives people to get into the streets. Like what, what do you think? pushed you away from that and made you realize you wanted to do business or build brands or whatever i mean you just start seeing your parents looking at you crazy and then then you know those uh, uh those fucking those coloring books start to look a little uh familiar you start realizing your fucking eighth grade homies getting chased by a helicopter and shit like that you see how how weird it makes their family mm. that's really what it was how much do you think of your life path was determined by your desire to get pussy uh i think most people if they were to be honest they would say like it's it's a lot I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to say little to none. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mm. mean, like, f- from the jump, it's like, you know, when I'm middle school, I understand, like, jokes to get me pussy. You know what I mean? And, like, I, I think as long as you have a good personality, it's going to get me there. But, like, uh, shit, I mean, the art, yeah, you you know, you envision yourself on a fucking island with six women or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? But, like, uh, from the jump, it's just, uh, I just want to have fun. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. You, were you getting flyer pussy? No. I'll, Do a fire flyer. And that- just- <laughs> some girl just knocks on your door (laughs) nah you know what to be honest with you i I don't think i like you know i had my fair share of like high school pussy tinder pussy you know Mm. but it didn't really start like coming knocking on my door until like three four years ago really yeah what do you think it was just the success or yeah for sure yeah yeah it's a weird thing and and i know you probably related on on a crazier scale but like you know they kind of like they're fucking with you off of like the work that you've put in for the last you know four years whether it's your followers whether it's you're talking to adam 22 whether it's because you did a little wayne merch whatever it right. is like they're just gravitating to the to the whole uh brand you know what i mean that's how i see it early days of no jumper before i got in the relationship with lena was when i really started to like have girls just straight up like want to have threesomes with me like them and their friend 
it's clear that they know that I don't give a fuck about them or anything, right. but they want to do it. They see me as like a good vessel for them to have this fun little party with. And I was so honored and taken <laughs> aback by that. Like, holy shit, how is this real? That should be fucking my hell. Cause it's like, <laughs> bitch, I'm not tagging you. I'm <laughs> yeah. probably not even following you. Hell no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's it's gotta like, be part of the do rules. You, do you just want like me to sign like your pussy autograph? Mm. You know, like, I don't know what it is like. Like, do you just want to be like, okay, like I got the Blasi co sign. Yeah, uh, but once you realize how bad girls are being name droppers and shit, and the, how they just <laughs> like to just tell rooms full of people, like, oh yeah, I fucked with M twenty two, and he did this, and blah, blah, blah. that's when that shit starts to be like more of a turnoff, and you start to realize like, oh, am I revealing like yeah. important private shit about myself to scumbag bitches that like have oh God. do not have my good my best intentions they in start, mind at all they start turning to academics themselves mm. <laughs> now all of a sudden they got dirt on you <laughs> for sure once you realize what a lick you are to that kind of shit ugh. It, ha it had to be, it, it was my friend that convinced me recently to tell me like bro you gotta chill with that really <laughs> yeah because like i ain't gonna lie like shit i be pillow talking in dms and shit you know you just fucking mm. around like oh you're the sweetest you're the cutest but like that shit don't do anything for nobody uh, but then once you start to like think about like what that looks like when it gets out exactly and just you being a little too open it's just i had fucking, to I, I, I had to take a step back from that kind of shit for really? sure yeah damn you're drunk off the cloud just soaking up all these opportunities huh mm, shit I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll see what it is i'll definitely you know like verify make sure it's a good uh, uh a good female malinka with but yeah mm. when you uh w what was the moment when you looked at the fucking uh the flyer shit or all this like smaller stuff that you were doing and you were like there's bigger shit for me here or, like how, how did you progress past that uh you know what it, it was really just my homies just seeing it for me i was doing fucking flyers well the thing is like i, I quit that shit by the time i was like 17 and okay. i was doing like street art all around hollywood and just different parts of little tokyo what and kind of stuff are you doing i was doing wheat pace of what oh uh, just my fucking designs I, I got a lot of shit on my phone i could show you but it, it was like you know fake deep art you know i was like 16 banksy was out mm. you know what i mean obey was a thing so is it cringe if you look back on it now oh it, it's the shittiest things <sighs> i ever seen and like it, it reminds me it's like bro like everyone has to start, start off really bad right and um you know but those were those uh, uh those those times that i'm gonna I'm a cherish and be like the, the, that was me just trying shit out um right. but right after that i was i returned back to flyers and cover art by the time i was 20 and you know what? It was really just people just finding work for me. Like, Blasi, we want to try you with T-shirts. Or like, hmm, let, let, let's try some fucking rolling trays today. Do you, you have I mean? anybody looking out for you? Or how do you start getting jobs in that world? You know what? To keep it real. So, look, check it out. When I was like 21, 22, I was down bad. You know what I'm saying? A couple hundred. I didn't have a, a social media. I just had Facebook. Living with your parents still? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, shit, I moved out like three, four years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, I was definitely living with my parents. I didn't have no social media. A couple hundred dollars to my name. I was the, uh, the security guard at Rock. Ross, the dude with the little vest okay making no money my homie came in one day he's like bro i know you want to be a graphic designer if you want to you gotta make a twitter which is fucking obvious nowadays but i was like what the fuck right maybe i should so i go ahead and do that and uh from from that moment on around 2015 it just it kind of just went from cover art to uh flyers and you know now was we do killing, the t-shirt designs was it killing your soul working at ross <clears throat> yeah for sure but you have i mean even at ross at that moment i still had to work like another three three years worth of just shitty jobs you know and it does sign to you when you're in your hometown and you see people you know you're on your fourth year out of high school and you see, you see people you see your old classmates and you're over here with the the tiniest vest talking about hello walking to ross you really? know what i'm saying like that shit does something to you but like it honestly teaches you like pressure and it's like fuck, i gotta get out of here like right. fuck all this shit but like i made a promise to myself like I'm not going to quit my job until I could afford my bills. And uh, around that time, I've been like three, four hundred dollars. Right. Um, that was all your bills were. Yeah, for sure. It's Cell good phone, to be young, right? It's good. Oh, my God. <laughs> like three, four hundred dollars. I might spend that at fucking yeah. the, the gas station. I don't know. You yeah. know what I mean? You can spend three, four hundred in a day without even trying. <laughs> yeah. You buy an ounce of weed, a couple meals. A couple lines. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're out of there. Never mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah. You're talking about lean or coke? No, lean. I don't, I, I don't fuck with any uppers. I never did. Oh, okay. Like, I didn't try ecstasy till like two years ago, and that was probably the last time. Really? You I didn't mean, like it? I just don't like 
any kind of upper like Adderall's cool. Right. You know what I mean? If it's crunch time, my back's against the wall and coffee's not doing it, I might tap in. But Are you the one that AD was talking no, about? No, no. <laughs> fuck no. I don't I do not do it recreationally like that. I'll do it. Somebody on the trip was taking Adderall. <laughs> Listen, if it's like, if there's a gun to my head and I need to do six things that night, it's 10 p.m., mm. Adderall. That's I, I put that shit behind a glass case and fucking really? smash it. You know what I mean? But, like, Coke, I mean, I tried it. Like, where I'm from, it's, like, you know, it's the Paisa capital of fucking Southern California in the sense that, like, like, uh, like Jenny 69, like, she would thrive where I'm from. Really? It's, like, 80% Hispanic. Like, a majority of people there are, like, straight from Mexico. Right. Um, she's pretty much, like, the Kim Kardashian of Mexican chicks at this oh, point, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. She's the queen? Yeah. On, I'll like, a street it. level? Yeah, a lot of girls, a lot of girls mm. don't like that. But, I mean, she is. I, I think it's just fun. It's cool. I you mean, know she's owning it. Like, she's really embracing <clears throat> the culture. Facts, She's but not trying to get away from it. But there was def there's a lot of like coke dealers and shit that I went to high school with, and like you know we would try it and shit in high school, but it, it never like I, I don't like the feeling in my throat, none of that shit. I might have done it like five, ten times, right, my whole life. So you're just plotting while you're working at the Ross, like are you you're plotting on how the fuck you're gonna make your escape and really start making some money, or is that the f- thing at the for- <laughs> forefront mean, of your brain? D- yeah, it is. I mean, like I'm, I'm I'm bragging to the to my coworkers, like look, I'm I'm doing this T-shirt design for thirty dollars, <laughs> you know what I mean? it's like i was definitely doing that but like i think that was like that was like 2014 2015 i didn't really get to quit and like do my thing till about 2018 right you know what i mean but it took years of perseverance and doing the f- random odd design jobs and doing business cards for your mom's friend that like kind of helped get it here but it was definitely a slow rise man at that point in your life were you more focused on like networking and getting these jobs or were you focused on like growing your skill set like were you were you a person who kind of naturally evolved in terms of design or was it something where you were having to put in long hours of studying no i mean like i had i had put in like my my like at that point i'm already maybe like 21 22 I already put in four years of just like basic Photoshop knowledge so at that point the rest was just like you know trial and error and like it was growing at that point um wait what was your question uh just was it more about networking and oh no it def i mean like from the jump like i used to do door-to-door sales for a whole year so i i understood the uh the aspect of selling yourself and you know trying to really develop a good rapport with your clients and right. from the jump like you know whether it was a five dollar or ten dollar design i'd always be there for people right do you feel like at this point though is it is it like is that really appealing to you? Just getting like a sort of one-off no. graphic job no. for some random person that you don't even know that well or whatever. That doesn't I get think, you excited. I think I stopped accepting random commissions like two years ago. Mm. Every now and then, if I'm on the toilet, you catch me at the right time. I'm going to throw a number at you. It's your choice if you want to pay that. But uh, generally speaking, it's like a private uh, client list now. And, it, and it, let's say if like Adam 22 is like, yo, I got this really cool guy named Kiki who needs some stuff done. Mm. I'll, I'll honor that. You know what I mean? But whether it's like a DM, like... A fool could have like 500k on their Instagram and like DM me. I probably wouldn't even check that shit. Because you gave Yuri that one tent docs design for free, right? Yes. And you said everybody that you fuck with gets one for free. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. Wait, okay. Where are you going with this? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've done plenty for us that we're all paid, so oh, I'm not yeah. going to go for the free one now. But like, what's uh, up, Blazzy? <laughs> but no. But that's that's kind of interesting because I mean. I don't know, like, how, how often do you ever reach out to people that you see doing something and just, no. like, offer your services? Never. Or how does that sh- Because, go? like, e- even you, you start you start to reflecting on the way you, you uh, interact with business. Like, how often do you go through your DMs and it's like, do you pitch? I mean, it's probably might be a little bit different. Mm. Um, but for myself, I've never, like, since day one, like, I might have DMed, like, maybe, like, five or ten people. Like, really? yo, I could do this. But, like, it's strictly been from, like, the dude down to my corner to fucking Lacoste and shit like that. Like, from A to Z. Right. But how do you start to get looped in with bigger jobs like that when you say the Lacoste thing? Like, how do they get in touch with you? You want to know who was, like, the gatekeeper who, like, granted me all this access while still working? Oh. Uh, Dylan Gerstung. He used to intern oh, really? for you. Oh, yeah. yeah, so at that time, it was, like, 2017 summer. I was working at LAX and he told me like, yo, no jumper needs a, a, some, some products design. I don't even think he told you. I think he was just a strict intern and uh, I pitched him a whole bunch of shit. I think he fell out with y'all and he went to Chinatown market at one point and uh, he really kept trying to sell me to the owner. I went there three separate times. I got denied both times. I went there like, yo, no, nah, these graphics ain't all that. Really? 
Third time, they were like, fuck it, we got to just have you in. And uh, from that relationship, you know, then came all, like, the Hollywood, uh, you know, projects and shit, you know? So, what, through Market, you start just meeting all these different people? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll say, I, I think Market was, like, the moment. Like, I was, like, three months into, like, leaving my job. I was already doing my thing, trying to do my, maybe, like, $1,000, $2,000 worth of income at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Market was... Uh, the, the first people who really like tried with me I mean at first they got so annoyed that I was trying to sell them on graphics at the time I was doing videos so they're like oh you're not there for graphics yet but we'll have you do video content just like swipe ups and just just stuff maybe you'll right. hire somebody but for. they had a bunch of in-house graphic designers at that time like how many different dudes were working on this together? no uh, they had they had two. Oh, okay three including the owner but uh, they had a small team but they were pumping out like four or five graphics a day but um, I wasn't adequate there and it wasn't until you know like I said I was doing flyers I was doing shit for like Fani that day it was a thousand man Fani Comethazine flyer and it was the coldest shit I made at the time and good Charlotte's uh, manager his name is Josh Madden he walks into the building and he sees me working I was like whoa that's hard we need some shit for good Charlotte and I'm like what okay for sure were you allowed to get freelance jobs on well, the job so, so check it out so I do it and uh, you know I'm posting on Instagram a week later like woohoo good Charlotte guys can you believe it uh, the owner puts me, you know, grabs me to the side the next day. Like, are you kidding me? This isn't right. And he pretty much just like realized like, damn, like Blazzy might be doing something with graphics. I, I guess I do got to fuck with him. Uh. And uh, from that moment on, he, he slowly started giving me projects. You know, I was still doing videos for like, you know, through market, of course, like for Puma, Urban mm. Outfitters. Like I was editing all all Chinatown Market's early videos were edited by me. Right. Um, but were you were you focused on video? Like when you look at doing video stuff versus doing graphics, is there one that you're more passionate about, or were you graphics. just going? You, you've always cared for that. More? Vid video was just like another like tool in my uh, in my box that I could go ahead and like use and like get money out of. Like the main goal at that at that point was just to survive making money off creativity. Whether it's videos, whether it's like yo, I need help fixing my YouTube. Right. You know, I was I was trying to help people out. But that's what's interesting to me is like how much of your come up and, and which directions you went in were because of the fact that you knew it would be more profitable and you could make more money versus what you were actually passionate about. Yeah. The reason why I say that is because now that I feel like I'm in a position where I kind of don't have to do corny shit for money anymore, mm -hmm. even though obviously, I mean, if you were to scroll through our Instagram page, you might, some see, NFTs. <laughs> you might see the brand doing some corny shit for money, but I don't feel like I have to do that anymore. Right. And it makes me think about how many times in my life I made a decision without necessarily realizing that I kind of was sacrificing my brand or just my integrity because I needed the bag. Oh yeah. No, a, a bag will have you do silly things. And that's the best part of like really finding out like what your niche is and like what you could really make money off of. Cause then now you don't have to make de desperate decisions. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and you don't even know it, but when you're really broke and you know, you could get thrown into anything like yeah. so, somebody say, Hey, Blasi fucking smuggle these drugs for me. And if they yeah. throw out a dollar amount, you might be like, shit, well, I never saw myself as a drug smuggler, but I'm about to go do this drive for you exactly. because that's how fucking much you need the money that you'll yeah. do something and risk doing a long ass bid just because you need that money. I it mean, was exactly like that, but for videos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't know if I should do this four hours of sitting on my laptop. Right. But uh, no, it, it was really just like showing Chinatown Market like, no, bro, I'm him with the with the t-shirt designs this is a new style you know get used to it and then what really set it off was you know at, at that point it was just straight just like hey turn in your timesheet at the end of the week you know i worked eight hours i'm getting paid 15 dollars an hour just for graphics that they're fucking using for like these major artists but it was little wayne carter five merch you know it was 2018 it was october and i had designed the project and they had told me like the day before a job, like it was about a job. They picked your graphic mm. and, um, you know, that graphic ended up being their best seller for that whole merch line, you know, wow. and it, it opened my eyes. It opened, you know, Mike Sherman, shout out to him, the owner of Chinatown Eyes. And later on that week, the next week, he was like, Blasi, you're now officially a salary designer. OK. And then from that that point that mo that moment on, he had me working on almost all the uh, the exclusive projects that they were doing. And so, how did this feel? Because it's like on one hand, your work is getting out there to a very big audience, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, you're getting, I assume, like very little credit for it. Oh yeah, I didn't get. I mean, they interviewed him <laughs> yeah. about like, yo, how did you make this graphic? You know what I'm saying? But like, I knew from I knew very early on, and this is just me being in the service industry, doing cover arts and flyers. It's like. If, if I do a flyer for Adam 22, he has no fucking reason to tag me. This is his moment, not mine. 
we're in my opinion like if i have an artist do something for me it's like i'm paying you so i don't have to tag exactly you, you know like exactly that, and it's not that i don't want to give you credit because if i really fuck with you i will tag you and i will like try to highlight yeah. shit but it's like if it's I'm, your moment yeah and it's like if you're posting a t-shirt design being like this is our new t-shirt it's like anything you tag like like you pay the model so you don't have to pay them tag the model yeah you know you pay the graphic designer so you don't have to tag them it's not that you don't want to give them credit but in that post, you only want to drive mm -hmm. traffic to one thing, which is buy this shirt. Yeah, you know? and, and I understood I understood that, like I said, from the jump, just doing through the cover arts for, like, fucking these random rappers that went to tag me. So I accepted it. So when that shit was going down, I was like, you know, I just got to I, I gotta play my role. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Whether I'm the ghost designer or this fucking, you know, celebrity designer dude, like, I just got to play my role and I got to shut up and work. How long did you grind out that shit for? Um, well, I was there at Chinatown Market as a, as a salary designer from like, I'm going to say September 2018 to about April 2019. And then from that moment on, um, you know, all due respect to them, they, they changed my life. You know what I'm saying? Like six months prior to that, I was working at the airport pushing wow. boxes for two years. And uh, they, I, I started making more money outside of uh, that, mm. that salary income. And then it got to the point where it's like, maybe I should make that jump. And we came to a disagreement. I think that... Uh, um, I th what I think really happened, I don't think he was expecting me to, like, grow that fast. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because then I, I seriously started having, like, a, a trail of people hitting me for designs around that time of 2019. I mean, anytime, That's when I started getting in with y'all. Right. Like, anytime you get somebody who's young and talented, that's always going to be, like, a possibility. Is yeah. that they're always the possibility. Like, if I get a, a podcaster tomorrow and I think they're great and they do too good and all of a sudden they're getting, like, 2 million views per episode, it's like all of a sudden they, they kind of grew too fast and it's like this is something you're going to have to manage now. Yeah. Like this becomes like a project of like, all right, like how are we going to keep them happy? Is it even a possibility that yeah. we're going to be able to keep them happy? You know, like you want to incubate talent but also you always have to be aware of like the risk slash, it's not really a risk because it's like, in theory it could be a good thing yeah. you know but you always have to be like ready for that and that's kind of like that's an interesting thing that i went through just for the fact that like you know i was dealing with somebody who felt like i put you in this world you know what i mean you should be repping mm -hmm. me fuck all these other weird commissions you're getting you know what i mean yeah. and now you know I, I was so stubborn i didn't see it from his perspective now the roles are reversed where i'm having other people hit my designers up right. <laughs> you know what i mean and, I, and I'm, I'm hitting up uh people and being like man it, it's ironic how i used to be so pissed off that like my boss wouldn't let me like work with others, and now I'm starting to realize it's like, bro, like you really gotta honor the uh, the uh, the fucking, I don't know, the chain of command. But uh, no, definitely it 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 went from doing Chinatown Market to me just doing freelance like seven months later. I mean, my thing is like I I should never expect you to do something that goes against your own incentives. You yeah. know, like if I want you to not fuck with any, if you're my graphic designer that is just like so important to my brand and I want you to not take any of these commissions, I should be paying you an amount that makes you not want to take any of those exactly. commissions. And that might be a tough dollar amount to get to, but I mean, yeah. that's just, you can't expect somebody to go against their own, you know, best interests exactly. financially or creatively, you know? Yeah. Somebody who's really motivated, you're just not going to be able to keep them in that box. Yeah. And I, I tell all my designers that I tell them like, bro, truth, truth be told, I don't see all y'all being here for the next five years. Right. I want you guys to go ahead and make your own pyramid and have everybody under you. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm very aware of that and I'm just trying to soak it up while I still can while, while they, while I have them here. Right. So you start, how do you start getting more jobs after the Chinatown thing? So like, like, or while you're still there even. So after that, like during that whole time, like from the jump, whether it was 2013, whether it was for fucking Julio down the street or Lil Wayne, I always put all my best work on my page. Mm. Cause I understand like the fucking dude at 1 AM, 2 AM, just stumbling across your Instagram. He's going to come across that shit and he wants to, that's what he wants to see. So I was big on that. So from that moment on, um, are you always allowed to expose everything that you designed, or are there no, certain contracts where it's like you're not even allowed to say you designed it? I would, up until maybe like three months ago that I, I run to an artist where it's like, because my office it's 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 inf it, it has a, a big ass board of just all my biggest projects. Right. Some are there illegally. I shouldn't be having those. But there's one guy who had me sign like so many NDAs about like you cannot do this, you cannot do that, and I'm never gonna. Not until I meet bro and I can shake his hand and be like, yo, I'm the guy who did your shit. Then am I going to start walking around like, yo, I did this shit. But yeah, NDAs aren't as common as you think they are. I'll be real with you. You know, like shout out to Universal Music Group. Great, great clients of mine. But like they've never hit me up with a project like, yo, before you even got to get started on this, sign this shit here. Right. It happened with Grateful Dead and, uh, you know, Redacted. Where you, you weren't allowed to talk about the fact that you designed using their shit? 
You designed for the Grateful Dead, or you did some weird merch collab because they've done so many different things over the last few years? I designed the, the market pieces okay, for thinking, Grateful yeah. Dead. Um, but they had to sign like some crazy hippie NDA. Of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you could not resell this. Right. But, how, uh, how did that happen? Like the, the Grateful Dead logo just all of a sudden gets out there in these like licensing departments and all of a sudden just yeah. like every brand is just using it, their graphics it, it's a whole business you have these like uh trend forecasters who just uh, who just like look at the whole vintage market right. you know what i mean for a while it was tupac you know what i mean i'm pretty sure pretty soon we're gonna see a bob marley resurgence but yeah. like i think from like 2018 to 2020 it was evident that the grateful den they have a cold fan base from day one right? right you know even in the 90s and the 2000s it's like but i think now more than ever like these graphics are cool I love teddy bears. Let's throw them on a shirt. Right. It's just like real, pure graphic design like that is so rare now. Yeah, very that rare. That it's like people just find themselves having to go back to real shit mm -hmm. from 40 years ago because it's like hard to come up with something iconic well, these days. Well, that's that's the biggest issue in the way people design is like we're so used to looking at references and trying to like try, trying to like harness that same type of energy that they had in the 90s. But it's like you got to create in 2022. You got to make people look in 40 years at this shit like, yo, this was it. Right. You know what I mean? And I feel like the only way you could do that is by not you, you kind of almost got to like force yourself not to look at those T-shirts. Right. You know what I mean? Like everything that I do that I drop, I try to make it relevant to today. But compare like, OK, so with nothing personal, you do very little like branded shit. There's mm -hmm. very little designs where it's like, OK, this shirt is just to have a plain nothing personal logo right. across the front. Whereas I look <laughs> at somebody like Desto Dub. And I'm like, that's how you do it. That's yeah. fucking smart. Because I know a million people who start a clothing line and they got 10 different shirts with 10 different graphics yep. and none of them hit. And with Dub, I saw somebody who just got one design that was doing good and he worked it into the fucking ground yeah. and just iterated on it over and over and over. Like, com compare those two. I think that, like, there, there are two success stories that work all the time. Mm. I think that there are brands where it's like you expect the, the 10 graphic t-shirts, but there's also people like Desto Dub or Anti-Social Social Club where it, 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 it's almost like you're buying, in, you're, you're buying into, like, the, uh, how, how can I say this, the, uh, the lifestyle, you know what I mean? Like, it's not the craziest, like, invention to have a last awful lot cough syrup, but everyone loves what it represents. Mm. You know what I mean? For me... Going into the, you know, starting off at, in the service industry, I was always aware that, like, I'm the graphic guy. You know what I mean? Like, you, I know what I'm good for. And, like, you know, truth be told, they want to see big T-shirts from me. They want to see the wacky accessories. You know, am I going to sell a thousand shirts that says nothing personal on the side? Maybe not today. You know what I mean? But, like, you just got to play your role. There, there are people like Desto Dub or, like, you know, even, like, Runts or, like, with, with cookies and stuff mm -hmm. who, like, they just got their logo. And, like, it doesn't matter where you're at. Any gas station, you'll see people wearing that shit. You right. know? Yeah, it is kind of crazy. That that makes sense though. Like, where is your value coming from? Because when you look at somebody like Dub, the the artistry wasn't necessarily going to be the the selling point. It mm -hmm. was just like his personality and like his personality slash life experience. Yeah. It's kind of like best expressed through one design over and over. Yeah. Whereas like your shit, I feel like you know the fact that you. Like, I feel like your creativity is kind of the whole thing. Your ideas, yeah. like your ability to let your brain go wild. I mean, I'm, I'm scared. Like, like I said, like, all, you know, all respects to Desto Dub, but I'm scared to get to that point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where it's like people just want one thing from me because you try to introduce something else. You might not get the best reaction. So from day one, whether it was the perk jersey or, you know, doing the fentanyl shirts or the, the sponge bobs, it's like I always told myself, like, I never want to glue myself to one product because right. that's all they're going to want from me. Um, so you know every every time i i release something new it's like all right what what's next after that you know i, I want to build my uh um i, I just want to build the legacy of just great products versus just you know just one or two pieces have you always been concerned with the scarcity of your products and wanting to keep them limited um no but i want that to be i, I, I only do that just to show that like this really isn't necessarily something that I want to treat as like a suit and tie business so far. Like, thankfully, I have my clients in place and I have my other business and my eggs lined up. So I don't have to look at nothing personal for like a money play. And, right. you know, and I don't have to sacrifice. And because that's when you start looking at, you know, like forecasts for fashion, you know, like, OK, you know, these Grateful Deads are popping. Maybe we should make a bear shirt. You know, what mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we should do that. All every single one of my ideas stems from just being in the car, stems from smoking, stems from <laughs> kicking with the homies, and like I think that's what makes my stuff special. <clears throat> you know, people could pe people could tell if it's from a real person or not. Because like when you have a brand, there's basically two routes that you can follow. You can do the shit that you know will be popular, mm -hmm. and like you know, I, I think of something like Huffed going heavy with the weed socks. You yeah. know, 
it's just a fucking huge amount of money that they can make right there off of that. But then it's like, meanwhile, that's clearly not like the thing that you're doing because you just think it's dope. Right. You know, like Supreme having a skate team is dope. Supreme yes. having these raw escape videos is dope. Nobody thinks that they're making actual money off of those videos in exactly. the short term. Clearly, they're paying the team. They're paying for the travel. They're paying for the filmer. It's like this is an expensive project obviously not expensive compared to like the entirety of the brand right but that shit 100 percent contributes to the coolness of supreme and on the other hand like huff making weed socks is does the opposite it kind of like wears the brand out and everything and and that's the whole thing with a brand is like you have to balance that to a certain extent but that's what i like about what you're doing is that it feels like there's not really much of a balancing act it's just yeah. purely like no i'm only going to do the shit that i think is cool and i get like 10 years from now like i'm kind of like it, it blows my mind to even think about what your brand could turn into if you keep treating it with that same integrity, you know? I mean, I definitely want to. I mean, it, it's really just following that production line for, for me uh, specifically, you know, because it, it's one thing to be the, the a creative guy. You know what I mean? It's cool. That's that's the easiest job of this shit is really learning about where can you get this made, dealing with it, accepting with an idea that no one's going to be able to see this shit for nine months mm. to a year you know what i mean and just putting it out um that that's a big factor in what i do though it's kind of crazy too because like i know a lot of brands who are doing what they think is cool and maybe the person who runs it i think that objectively they're a cool person and they have good taste and stuff but still they toil away in obscurity for like 10 years 20 years or whatever until the brand eventually dies because right. they just lack that marketing component they mm -hmm. lack the thing of getting everybody to pay attention to it which is understandable because trying to get everybody to pay attention to your brand is mm -hmm. kind of like the least cool thing that a brand could possibly do. It's the lamest do. shit, yeah. you know, and, and I think most brand owners, they got to take a step back and look at themselves as consumers. Like, would you be into this shit if you mm. saw it on your page all day? You know what I mean? It's like, even, you know, like for myself, like I'm wearing a Carhartt jacket. I don't follow Carhartt on Instagram. Mm. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. it, it, it goes with most of my fit that I'm wearing today. It's like, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, we people just got to do better with showcasing products and it's less about the marketing aspect but you know marketing gets you those sales you know what i mean you got, almost got to have those instagram ads in place yeah, yeah. you know it's it, talking it, about that with trevor it's a balance mm. it's for show a balance right definitely but okay the perk jersey that was while you were still at market no 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 that was uh, uh that was about like six months after but that mm -hmm. was the first product that i ever like that, that i personally oh, released that went viral and i got like full like i got you know 70 or 80 percent of the money out of right you know what i mean what what uh so what you had to give house phone a percentage well well here's the thing so and like the designer or or no who'd, who'd you give it to uh i does so i gave it so i'm the one who designed it but uh it was house phone in it and it was also base savage shout out to base savage oh, right 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 the twitter lord so at this point mine and house phones twitters are deleted we're, we're sampling this uh this jersey why'd you get deleted um, I told like a bitch to shut up one day. And you know what Jeez. sucks? And you got deleted forever. Yeah. And and I tried I tried appealing like listen guys, this is a business account. You can check my my, my record. I don't talk like this. So I was just hot one day. They really deleted but me. But like bitch shut up. So, yeah, Lando. Jesus. Yeah. I think it was something along the lines of like men should pay for everything or you know, Elon, buy Twitter and, and give his his fucking account back this and house crazy. phone. Yeah. So so God, what, damn. yeah. So what happened was House Phone leaks it on his fucking on his Instagram story like he does all the everything, <laughs> and uh, someone screenshotted within five minutes after me telling him delete it. It goes viral on Twitter through Bay Savage. He said Paris Fashion Week or mm. Atlanta Fashion Week posted it, <laughs> thousands of likes. My homie's in the car with me. He's like, Yo, bro, uh, check out this fucking jersey. It's funny. Right. And I'm like, This shit's fucking mine. What's going on? Yeah. And I call Bay Savage because he's the first one to ever pay me for a hundred dollars. Like I've been knowing him since like 2016. Like right. he, he he's the fuck with me on cover art so i call him like look bro this is my jersey but there's money to be made look i'm gonna drop these on monday i need you to put this shit on your twitter and tell everybody yo come shop with me it's on my site now right and he did that and you know it helped propel it, it I, th I think he I this think whole time i thought you were talking about base jesus <laughs> am i talking about, about base base jesus with the jesus fucking uh avatar no, not no, not him. No, 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 oh, no. Base Savage that is a different dude. I think it would have went crazier with Base Jesus. Nah, but shout out to Base Savage for show. But uh, he he posted it, and then like I called him. He was totally understanding, and you know I think I think just off the tweet, you Wait, know, did Bad, Base Savage got deleted. Yeah, oh, you, yeah, you, you didn't did. see like all the shit, dude. He was on CNN. I was thinking, I'm like, why haven't I seen this guy? He was on, on CNN. Forever? He was on the FBI. All that shit for, for what? 
Uh, he said, "I'd rather smoke crack than serve my country," and it went on. It went crazy online. Why would the fucking? It went on CNN. There's, but why would he get investigated over that? I don't know. It's a fucking joke. I mean, they don't got shit going on at those offices. But uh, uh, he I don't want to serve my country either. He went on CNN twice. He he made like a, a I think when there was like bombings in the Middle East like six months ago. He 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 said something along the lines of like, "Oh, that's Lizzo," and then he he ended up on on CNN again. What the fuck? There's someone at CNN following Bay Savage. It's crazy because they probably saw the. Perk jersey. That's crazy. No, because with Base Jesus back in the day, I got a fucking Ethel Wolf collab with On Some Shit, and we fucking had Base Jesus like promote the contest. We did like a oh, contest, wow. and I think I got like a couple thousand followers back when I had like yeah ten thousand followers. Not the meme pages be geeked. coming through. They are important to tap in with. That's that's networking. Yeah, exactly. People but talk about going to fucking Soho House as networking. That shit's lame. Meme Fuck. pages are real networking. Oh god, man. Fuck everybody there. But but check it out, man. Like he he posted it on a Friday, it went viral. By Monday, we're selling this shit. And I put it on my site like 12 hours before I was actually supposed to drop it. I'm mm. like, let me see who clicks it. I wake up at like noon the next day and it's like 20 bands in my account. And I was like, what the fuck? Like prior to that, I mean I probably made like, you know. A thousand dollars in a day or something like that. And you weren't worried about having to get them made. You already knew you were. Well, that's the scary part. I I, I was still like, I I was still running my brand very stupid. I only had the sample, and I'm like, um, this is an eighty to eight dollar item. They put it on there for that. And uh, I went to downtown later on that week, and I find out like, nah, they're they're trying to charge me like forty fifty. And I'm like, there ain't really. I ended up selling around like five hundred. I'm like, there, there ain't really too much money if I'm selling for forty. I had somebody who had me out with the manufacturing, found somebody in Pakistan doing for six dollars, and oh, wow. I profited crazy off of How those. How long did it take you to get them? <sighs> like four or five months for show. Sure, so of those people brands. didn't get their orders for that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome, w- welcome to Instagram streetwear. Were they pissed? <laughs> yeah, for oh, sure. Everybody's man. pissed. You know, they but were trying to ask pizza you. I, I was ass pizza in them. <laughs> they were yeah. like, they were like, oh, Blazzy got us. I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. No, wow. no, nah, nah, I ended up shipping them though, but. uh no, that that project alone, I mean, like House Phone got upset too, because we, uh, uh, I broke off like Bay Savage maybe a little bit too much. Right, I, I got a little bit too like excited over the phone with him, I'm like, bro, I'll give you ten percent. Well, Fuck it. Especially considering that you fucking got Juice World to promote it. Did did that move the needle like crazy or? Yes, yes. Well, Juice World and OGZ, like oh, OGZ, yeah, too, right, like right. he he tagged me and all this shit. Wow. And like we made up with him at a uh, that day in Vegas. That oh, one I seen weekend. him there, and he well, he was wearing it there, Bro, right? It was so crazy because like House Phone's like, "Yo, I'm battling with Shorn," and I I didn't met him. Watch at that the point. No Jumper vlog from that festival, and you'll see me kicking it with OGZ, who I would objectively say is on ecstasy in that clip. Oh, he was for show off <laughs> ecstasy. So like House Phone's like, "Bro, come with me. We're gonna meet. We're gonna meet uh, Shoreline. The, the, we, let's get him some jerseys." We go to like the exclusive side of the backstage. Okay, you know what I mean? Where it's like little baby and fucking Playboy Cardi and shit, and, and their mm. little like in, in their uh, in, in, in their area and we go in there he fucks with it Every, everything's all good he shows love 20 minutes later I'm, I'm just at the cafeteria and I hear like bands go off during Lil Tecca set I step out and I'm like he's wearing my fucking jersey wow. I go rush and record a video it, it was a good weekend but he tagged me after that Juice World posted it um and we we did like a, a Black Friday restock and we sold out again oh, you know? wow. but that was the last time we ever sold them till this day it's like Oh my God! They're all over TikTok. It's all mm. over Instagram, Amazon. But I don't how's even that give feel? Because you feel like that kind of hurts your brand to have this bootleg version of no. it that's being sold everywhere, and probably a lot of people think that it's yours when they see it out. I, I think I think people nowadays when they see a perk, they don't even think about Blazzy. They just think mm. about oh, <laughs> perks, you know, <laughs> and yeah. like. It, I, I felt really guilty bringing that shit into the world, bro. Yeah, because I was gonna at, ask about that. At that point, and I mean, even still to this day, I might have taken like three, five perks my whole life. Mm. I, I it's not for me. I hated it. I haven't tried one in like two years. But when I made that jersey, I didn't know what perks were. You know, I thought it was just a stupid internet joke. You know what I mean? Then all your friends start dropping like flies from that shit. Mm. And I had people overdose in my apartment off of fucking perks. And that shit broke my heart. You overdose know I mean? like died or overdose yeah. like went to the hospital? Well, well, check it out. He overdosed. We're over here slapping them and shit. Shout out to Cam Girl. She was like, guys, I think he's overdosing. And we're here like, fuck, is someone going to die in my crib? This is crazy. And uh, uh, we tried. This is, some, this is my homie from like from back where i'm from who who had just done jail for like fucking a year for like breaking into someone's home Whoa. and he's already a week later overdosing in my crib i you know we, we bring it to the front yard uh, we're on the phone with 911 i'm doing mouth to mouth uh resuscitation what the fuck you call it and uh um he's not re- n- not like being receptive all our homies are crying and shit like that 
we we think he's dead. The uh, the paramedics come and just Narcan his ass. Just fucking wakes up. Where am I? You know what I mean. And I had to tell him like, bro, the I paramedics can't. just jammed him in the chest with that shit, and yeah, he woke up. Pulp, pulp Fiction style. The Narcan's that good. Yeah, it just brings you back to life. Narcan be smacking, but wow. uh, yeah, he came back and uh, um, I had to draw him out to the fucking hospital. I'm like, bro, like you know, I, I I can't I can't be dealing with that shit anymore. And like, ironically enough, well, sad enough, the 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 same batch that he bought that uh, those perks from, our other homie ended up dying, but he didn't have those friends around him that night to to, to check him. And oh, so they were fake perks. Oh yeah, I mean, ninety five percent of this shit's fake perks, bro. That's why, like, I'm so big on the say no offend not movement, just because that's the crack of of our generation. Yeah. Like, I truly feel that way. It's it's the same way people were like glamorizing how how sick it is. You know what I mean? And it's like, k- kids kids don't know there's a two dollar and a ten dollar or thirty dollar pill. You right. know what I mean? As long as they call them blues now because they know it's fentanyl, they don't even call them perks. Right. They're like, oh, I want some blues. That's crazy. I mean, really, like, I had the luxury of my time taking Xanax was mostly a time period where you really yeah. didn't hear about that happening oh, that yeah. much. Then it happens to Peep, and then we all start to kind of, like, understand, like, oh, shit, like, he thought that he was taking a Xan. It was fucking fentanyl in it, and that's how that went you down. You want to know something really we, cr- we really didn't know until then. Can I tell you something about a uh, little Peep situation? Yeah. Um the do you, i'm i'm not sure you remember but his last tweet one of his last tweets was like free my biggest fan nick bonds yeah. something along to that extent that kid bought a perk jersey off of me three months late sorry like a couple years later and uh, i go on facetime with him for like two hours start telling me how the how, how the rolling stones interviewed him and i'm not sure if it was his sister yeah yeah for that peep article right? exactly yeah. i'm not sure if it was his sister or his cousin but he knew the girl that everyone was framing i was like oh that's that's the girl who killed them right, yeah she ended up overdosing or like committing suicide like not too long after that. And I don't even I, I, I feel like I heard that it wasn't really her that was responsible for it. Well, he told I'm, I'm not sure if I'm breaking news, but he told me that like, you know, when, when he left, he, he checked in with Magnet and everybody was like, yo, guys, like he's not doing his best. Like he said that they were just dabbing peep out and he was talking about how how much he loved his outfits. I have like a 10 minute video recorded on my phone of just like our conversation wow. in like 2020. I, I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? But had, uh, had you even thought about the moral implication of making a Percocet journey, jersey before you did it or no, you just thought about I, it afterwards? Just like the rest of Twitter and Instagram, we all thought it was a joke we mm. all oh this is me off of perk 30 this is you know when the 30 hits you know everyone thinks it's funny but like like i said like i think like right after that i say probably I lost like five six friends from just like fentanyl overdoses like wow. like death you know not just necessarily overdose but like they died right you know what i mean and then i just you know then then people start smoking them and then you realize this shit is really really bad you know that's just ugly yeah was there a time point period where you like really kind of had to go out of your way to separate yourself from people who were doing no, drugs you- no my whole life like um not my whole life i, I was around some rusty crusty people and middle school and high school but like uh as an adult uh no i don't really like surround myself with too many like druggies you know what i mean i, I have my homies you feel me like we'll link up on a saturday but mm-hmm. like i'm not i'm not really around that and around then those are just the loose end homies that like just so happen to do that shit but like i don't like i I get disgusted you know I, everyone got their demons and i don't judge people for doing perks if they have no choice you know they're addicted but like mm-hmm. i can't have those people around me right yeah i really look at them as like sick well, people now you know it, it, and i don't want to like drug shame anybody but right. they're, they're kind of hard to trust yeah they're, they're really they're really untrustworthy because they they realize that they've gone to they've sunk into a place where like their their honesty is the only thing they have so they're gonna lie their ass off to see if they could sell you on like i'm clean dude you know and i just don't i'm starting to be able to like pick up on like these perk head lies and shit more and more better when i think about the timeline of your life it feels like you maybe like got your shit together and started to live be more serious about your business and your life Mm -hmm. when you were dating kim yeah yeah for sure accurate because she's a very straight edged person not literally straight edge but she's like a hard line person like she she likes things to be done the right way my my first apartment was uh it kind of was a bm it was a design flop house but like everyone would just be smoking blunts there you know kim she don't smoke you know i mean she's gonna walk she's gonna walk in with her face mask to everybody leave and uh no she definitely brought uh you know some positivity i remember when we had our first apartment the rule was like no no smoking blunts in the house till this day i don't do that really yeah I mean, at the office, shit, I'm gonna roll a fucking a pound blunt, but like <laughs> at home, nah. Really, you just like to keep the the air pure in there, or what? Yeah, yeah. Mm. A girl would definitely put you on a couple of those things. At this point, my house is big enough that uh, I can smoke a blunt while my girl's asleep, and then my girl will wake up in the morning and not know I smoked a blunt in the house. 
That's, I mean, I just because the ceilings are kind of high, it's like decently <laughs> ventilated, which <laughs> is kind of nice. Now that you mentioned that, when when y'all used to do the no jumper show, that's definitely what I was doing while she was gone for two, three hours, <laughs> oh, in a blunt with, with big smoke and shit in my living room. Oh, if I, I open the door, or open the window, oh my god, yeah, she'll yeah it's never over. Know. I don't it's even over. bother though. But it then, turns into Wiz Khalifa. But she there. trips out because she'll like wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, realize I'm smoking, and then. Like, even though the kid is all the way over there sleeping, mm -hmm. it's like the fucking door is closed. It's like, yeah, I've learned to do like dabs in the house, which dabs aren't like too far from fucking perks. I feel uh, you just do those at night. I, I can't smoke at all at night. Uh -huh. If I smoke at night, I can't go to sleep. I'm on my phone. I'm on TikTok. I'm shopping. I'm on eBay. Really? I can't go to sleep on weed. But like they I'm like the opposite because people are like, dude, how do you fucking work if you're high all the time? It's like, don't really affect me like that. But to me it's two different things like if i'm if i'm doing a meeting with the real estate agent i don't want to be high absolutely yeah. but if i'm going to be sitting around like part of my job is that i'm going to like watch fucking podcasts for like four hours tonight mm -hmm. and it's like i just need to be high during that because it's just like i don't know i mean the fact that i can't finish that sentence probably says a lot <laughs> because i'm just fucking addicted to it but i don't know it's like there's certain things where i just really don't want to be high yeah exercise for the most part i'm not trying to be high you know like even doing an interview tax stuff i don't want to be like super high if i'm like even sort of on edge yeah tax math shit my, like. my family i might smoke a joint on the way to go see my mom but like i'm not like smacking edibles and yeah. pouring up before i link up with my pops and shit but is your like your day-to-day -day workload at this point is it mostly creative or do you have to deal with a lot of administrative it's, bullshit it's honestly it, it's gotten i mean because i didn't have a team last january I, I just started developing you know a group of people now i got seven people on my team and half of it is administrative you know i mean it's answering the emails it's getting your designers in the room you know plotting shit out and you know i think it's helped me take my job a little bit more serious because now i'm really like having stronger ideas because i'm combining what what would have been like four or five t-shirts into like one mm -hmm. you know what i mean i'm really putting like my, my my grind and my brain into one what's that creative process like when you 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 like i mean i'm sure it's very different when nothing personal where you can go in any direction yeah versus when it's like okay phase clan not a ton of direction just come up with shit yeah i mean it, it's it's on a case-by-case -case basis sometime man 22 is gonna be like i want a shirt that looks like a remote control right or sometimes you'll come to me and be like Shout i don't know remote control you'll be like i don't know blasi just make some hard shit you know mm. what i mean as great designer you hate those words but like I've, I've learned to kind of like assume and like kind of design around that mm. um but it's really a case-by-case -case basis face clan i've you know we've been developing the uh the streetwear stuff for about like two years now and mm. it's 80 percent of it has just been me so like at this point with me and them they we, we have a good relationship where i could just make some shit and 80 percent of the times they'll say yes nice what like okay take this this ashtray that i feel like everybody's kind of a fan of it's mm -hmm. obviously broken right now normally the, the tongue was Shout out which sharp. was kind of like the whole cool part about it was the tongue thing it's so cool but when you were thinking of that like was your brain going like i want to make an ashtray and yeah. so I'm going to think of different cool ashtray ideas. Literally, dude. I mean, especially with the product development, that's how it starts. It's like, I'm not trying to release anything that, like, is going to collect dust or that's mm -hmm. going to be, like, not used. Like, I'm trying to make double cup mugs and piggy banks so you can interact with every day. So, like, the first checkpoint is, can you use it? it, it does it have utility, mm -hmm. essentially, you know? And then you just start going into juxtaposition and what's the best way to like cross these two ideas you know it started off with like ashing okay what do you ash on i've seen people ash on tongues and photos that's funny you know what i mean let's do this and then you start adding to it my favorite part one of my favorite parts is making the name ash on me ashley that's just it's catchy mm. you know what i mean people love that shit can you open that orange box over there and bring us that too because this is like another one that i just want to know like where this fucking idea came from hell yeah we finna spark that blunt. Oh, you want to? Yeah, let's do it. Hell yeah. But this, this is another one that we got to fucking get our heads around. But yeah, I, I like, because is that like the thrill to you at this point? Because you've done so many fucking t-shirts. Yeah. That it's like the idea of making something that's 3D that could actually have like a different value to people. Well, the thing is, I'm aware of like, you know, me being a fan of the culture. I'm aware of like the, the lifeline of a creative in, in the... Uh, sorry, the timeline of a creative in the sense that like, you cannot be doing the same thing for years that's like the dust bag i believe oh, okay. but uh uh it's like a planter for the record yeah no it, it's it, the, that right there is a planter and like i, I can't network we're gonna put plants in it that would be super hard yeah. i've seen i think zach ftp got like bread in his really yeah he got stacks and shit 
Uh, oh, um, money. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, you thought you had like just a loaf of rye bread in there? Well, I mean, <laughs> it is kind of hard to imagine now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, w with that kind of stuff, it, it just stems. It's like, what, what's the weirdest thing we could think of? I originally wanted that to be a fish tank. And then, you know, all these factories started telling me you can't be doing that. You know what I mean? It's not humane for the fish. Oh. So then someone from Network side, shout out to Network, great people Thankf there. Thankfully for them that they pointed that out to you because you don't want to be catching a lawsuit. Imagine get the PETA cancel. I mean, PETA in my DMs. That I think would be good for you because who the fuck? cares what they and I would say, troll the shit out getting of getting sued in general would suck though you I, know i would drop you know what would be you know would be a good idea a, a leather pita jacket like like a fucking nascar <laughs> jacket that just says pita all over it that, that's a free one them. for y'all i want to see that idea. shit get made but okay that's a good question though is like a lot of people i look at zach ftp what was his first viral thing columbine university right. or high school shirts or mm -hmm. whatever you know like he was going on twitter dissing pink dolphin and all these other brands and shit right so you're looking at somebody who i consider one of the the best young streetwear designers from this Hell whole yeah. no jumper generation somebody i'm super proud of but look at what his first viral thing was he was fucking doing stuff that he might not really be super proud of it was objectively you know aggressive it was offensive whatever you look at your shit you look at something like the perk 30 jersey which yeah. a couple of years removed from that you're like i would not do that again you know it's like a lot of people kind of have this moment where they are doing stuff that's a little edgy a little aggressive and, yeah. and that kind of like launches the brand and then you're able to go in directions afterwards that are maybe not as offensive that's you know i never really took a step back and like considered that being like my my edgy moment where a it's lot like of that's how you kind of get into the a game. A lot of rappers come out with a diss song. That's right. their entry into the game is that they diss somebody and then hopefully they can take that energy and convert it into giving a my, fuck about hearing you talk about other things. My, my Perk 30 jersey was a diss song. That's hard. That's how I came into the game. I can see it. <laughs> Not for sure. Um, but, you know, going back to like, you know, making these products is, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that like, if you keep making T-shirts, there's going to be someone in the next couple of years going to pass you up. It's all about reinventing yourself as a designer. And like me having this street street art background where it's like I was a fan of Banksy and Obey and shit. Like, that's my main goal. Like in five, 10 years, that's my roadmap. I want to be to the point of like cause where you're just making a big ass sculpture for the city of Tokyo mm -hmm. or, you know, you're, you're just making something for apartment complexes. You know, and this is going to help me get there because, you know, slowly but surely, you know, it starts from fucking five inches and then it goes to a, you know, a 13 inch Birkin bag. And, you know, hopefully I'll be doing two feet items pretty but soon. It's interesting when you think about sort of like reverse engineering your life to get to the point that you want to be at. I said that to my girl the other day. I said, yeah. think about what kind of 50 year old you would want to be like yeah. how, what kind of 50 year old you can imagine yourself being and then you sort of like especially at this point you can kind of reverse engineer everything in your life to try to end up like that person yeah. and when you say the cause thing i mean <coughs> do, you, do you study the career paths of the artists who've come before yeah. you that have accomplished amazing things yeah. and you try to like think about how, what's your version of that going to be even down to music you know I'll, everyone will hear a kanye west interview and, and pick up a little something that like kind of like remembers them of themselves you know mm. um but I watch a lot of videos on that. You know, I do a lot of history, you know, research, learning how Virgil came up or Matthew Williams or anybody like that, you know, because it's all insight. And I think anyone who just makes money professionally off of like creativity, there's there's always something to learn from that person. But mm. well, how do you feel about the sort of culture of like, too cool for school and this that I've seen you talking about on your Instagram story uh, the other day. A lot of people who are trying to do what you're doing, like if you were to look at their career paths, more often than not, they're very limited in how much they talk on camera and they tend to really like be sort of reclusive. Like the number of times that you even saw Virgil talk on camera, I mean, mm -hmm. it's very few, all things yeah. considered. Like, like, but then you're kind of going a different way where you're very open on social media. You're letting it all hang out. You're doing podcasts. Like you're not scared to put yourself yeah. out there. Like, and how, with, how do you feel about that? Which first off, the podcast thing, people, I was, you know, I was asking my, my fair share of homies, like, is this a good idea? All my desire homies were like, no, what the fuck? You know, really? what's the matter with you, bro? You're going to look dumb. And, and that, that's taken as like basic fashion advice or whatever. Exactly. That you, and, you shouldn't put yourself out there. And like I that. think it really stems from is just like the old generation. You know what I mean? Like it, when, when you think about fashion when you're in high school, you think about, you know, eating, mm -hmm. unks, 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 you know, just dark suits and tailored dresses. You know <laughs> what I mean? And like, I think I think the generation that came before me was street streetwear kind of try to like incorporate <coughs> that and like really do the exclusivity. I mean, like, I was 16 walking into Supreme feeling like, damn, it's cold in here. I, I don't feel welcomed. People are giving me ugly looks. Mm. I felt I felt lame. You know, what I mean, I felt stupid. And like I always told myself, like, I never want I never want my audience to feel that way. Mm. You know what I mean? So 
I, I, I'm really trying to like sell my all my designer homies, bro. Like we gotta talk more. There's so I get the DMs every day. I know you do too. People asking how you do this, how you do that. It it's not like they're gonna be able to be you. Mm. You're you. You know what I'm saying? So just share this information because when these kids come up, you want them to be like Blazzy helped me. Right. You know, I mean? I've seen what Blazzy did and that helped me get to there. That's that's exciting. That that's really a timeline of a creative. You want to be that fucking OG role. The only way you could do it is if you show your face there. But you said all your fashion homies are gatekeepers. Yes. For show, sure. mm. and I feel that I'll, I'll say it right now. You know what I mean? Like none of them want to like show love. I always had to fucking like push them to show love. You know what I'm saying? I, I had like four four designers in my office. <clears throat> Each of them make well over a million dollars. Right. You be wearing you be wearing one of the brands that 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 was there with me, and I told them like, yo, bro, we were having just like how we would have it on Disconnector. You'd have it on No Jumper. We we're having an amazing conversation. It was undocumented. I'm like, bro, I have a Twitch. I'm about going live in like 30 minutes. Y'all just want to do this? They're like, yeah. <laughs> Turn around like, hey, we're, we're all out, bro. Yeah, yeah, we're heading out. I'm like, oh, my fucking God. Like, they weren't into it. No, bro. And, and their, their whole thing is like, oh, you know, I just want the uh, the work to speak for itself. Mm. But it's like, bro, you could say the same about music and sports, but that doesn't mean that, the, like, the is Kobe lame because, you know, he, he fucking did interviews and he did those inspirational talks? You know what I mean? No. It kind of just adds to the persona and it right. adds to the brand. So I think like, it's great to be Playboy Cardi or Kendrick where you can, like, you know, not put music out for years and years and years and keep your fan base and keep them just chomping at every little tiny bit of something right. you put out there. But the thing is, is that you got to actually become that exactly. first. You know? Like, exactly. Like, I feel like, you know, Kendrick Lamar or Cardi, even though that was a very different age, they did have a phase in their career in which they wanted attention and shit, and it was only once they started getting more attention than they could handle that they fell back and started to really like utilize the scarcity exactly. with their personality. But I feel like the new generation of people building brands and stuff are just the ones who win i think are going to be the ones who put themselves out there more exactly because this is just like a new generation and especially with you like you're a f like okay if I was going to do a fashion brand and like I wasn't doing a no jumper thing or whatever, it's like, yeah, maybe me being low key might be smart right. because I don't think I'm necessarily like going to be that sympathetic character. But when you look at somebody like Tyler or Virgil, who are like great fashion based entrepreneurs of our time, right. it's like the people want to get behind them because they see them, they see the struggle, they see where they came from. And that means so much to people now. Like it's very hard to get people behind a brand unless they feel like they understand the narrative of why it's important. Exactly. And you really just want to check in like, like one downside of that whole obscurity and being quiet is like, you, you, you are placing that idea in somebody's head. Like maybe this guy's just corny and he don't got shit to say, mm. you know? And I think they're truly like killing the whole uh, community just because it's like, if, if there's only gonna be one person talking, it's not, it's not as valuable as if there's 20 people's opinions and perspectives on how to run a business, then mm. you really have a fruitful community. Right. You know what I mean? But I feel like the streetwear community is really shooting themselves in the leg. They're, they're looking at the shit from like 2012 and 2013 when they walk in the black scale or they walk in the undefeated and feeling <coughs> those cold feelings. They want to fucking do that for their shit. Mm. But me, man, I'm trying to talk to everybody. Like I, I want to show kids, especially from where I'm from, like you could do this shit too, bro. When you look at somebody like Joe Budden, who back in the day, he uh, had an opportunity to be a radio host. He was supposed to be on Hot 97. And his his label said, nah, because like we don't think that people are going to fuck with you as a rapper if they can go see you talk on the radio every day and they see this much of your personality on a regular basis and everything. And at that time, that was kind of like common lo logic was like you don't, you know, if you're an artist, you don't want to put yourself out there that much. And now Joe Budden, looking at where his career has gone from there, he's like, he probably could have like been building his media personality business for like 10 plus years more than he was because exactly. if he had started at that point if he had always kind of been the rapper that was able to get on camera that, and you know have conversations and stuff i mean given that that's where his career was going like he looks back at that like that was an l like if he had embraced that earlier and not had the fucking label telling him not to do that then that would have been huge for his career exactly do you think joe bunnan was like kind of like part of that first generation of just rappers you know turned like also co podcasters yeah because when i started i was looking at him as basically like the only rapper like the that has started the podcast yes he was like the only and he basically had to like sacrifice his music career for that because he stopped making music pretty early on in the podcast right. thing and it's like 
I think that made sense for him at that point. But yeah, definitely Joe Budden opened that door look, for all these rappers that look podcast how, now. Yeah, look how many people it, it uh, convinced or it kind of inspired to do it after COVID. You know what I mean? Like now you have a, a full range of podcasts. Not, like some are shitty, but like a majority of them big got perspectives. They're yeah. good. And it, I don't think it would have been there if it wasn't for Joe Budden being like, yo, like it's not a big deal. It's not that deep. Y'all could do this shit too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Being early on shit is such a huge yeah. part of like getting in there and just making something happen for yeah. yourself. And for me, every like, like there's so many different things, social networking wise or whatever that I look at and I'm just like, fuck, I wish I got on board. Like, I wish I had a Patreon three years before I did. I wish right. I had fucking started the plug talk thing before I like many for years sure. before I did all these things where I'm like, holy fuck, my life would be so much more advanced if I had just figured out all these little things. Facebook. I wish I fucking understood Facebook earlier than I did. Or Doing like good for you now, right? You said crazy. But then meanwhile, like Snapchat, like I have a million Snapchat followers and I would not have that if I hadn't just fucking happened to have been using the app early on, you know, and it's like little things like that, like just end up being huge parts of the puzzle over time you know yeah so i'm really just trying to like you know just show the designers out there it's like bro like we have voices you know kids want to hear us they you know there it's no longer i want to be a rapper kid in high school they're like i want to be a fashion designer i want mm. i want to make fucking ashley's you know what i mean i want to do abc and they're not <laughs> able to like see that vision without somebody speaking upon it you know mm. what i mean um i had a friend tell me who's a, a, again like a, a million dollars a year designer and he, he couldn't believe that some of these blogs weren't me. He, he thought that, like, I ran a couple of these blogs. I'm like, no. He's like, bro, why do they post you so much? I'm like, bro, I'm the only one talking. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you really got to put your face out there. You really got to let people know, you know what I mean, your story. And, and it's, it's also like if you were pushing some basic as simple design-based shit, then I kind of could see how the podcasting thing might work against that in mm -hmm. some way. But because... Your whole brand is like based on like the, the the creativity and the designs that you guys come out with and just how dope the designs are. It feels like it's a completely different world than whatever fucking conversation you're having on the podcast. Yes. So I don't really see it as affecting that that much. at all. You know what I mean? I, and I, I'm not I have like, you know, a couple dozen things coming out, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, you I, I try to have them separate for sure. Right. When you go into the office, though, what are you what are you thinking? Like, is it which uh, this office or your, uh, my office? your office? Okay. Like. Is your goal to just post up on your computer and do you have just like a fucking whole sea of emails of different projects that you should be working on and you just sort of sit down and just pick one yes. and just start brainstorming? Literally. So I have I have a I have a just a fucking notorious notes tab where it's like 60 other things, whether it's like, oh, maybe I should pitch this to Adam. Write that down. Or, oh, I got to respond to this email or, yo, fucking rent's due tomorrow. Like I have a list and every morning when I get to the office, you know what I mean? I just, I make sure to have like 10 to 20 things to do, whether it's emailing or designing, a, a, you know, somebody's album merch, you know what I mean? But it's it's a lot to juggle, but I love the madness, you know what I mean? But it has gotten to the point where it's like, you know, I almost get anxious when there's no, when there's nothing to do, you know what I mean? Right, because it's easy to get going when you have like 20 projects that you're looking at, like, holy fuck, I need to start chipping away at this. But when you're, like, when you don't have anything ready, is that uh, often like a source of like real creativity when you are working from a blank slate? It's it's. It, it's both because I do find a lot of inspiration working for like a fucking random weed brand or mm -hmm. like doing a, a homies t-shirt that day. Cause there are, you know, a, as you're meticulously designed, you are thinking about like, Oh, this is my shirt. I do it like that. Or sometimes yeah. there's been times where I'm working on somebody's shit and I'm like, fuck this shit. I'm saving this as my own thing. I'm doing a fresh new graphic. Or like, say you're, you're designing something for runs and then you just have like a brainstorm, you know, you're, you're, adding a texture to one random part of a graphic and you just think oh fuck i could do a graphic like this this and this for my shit does that go in the notes tab like do a nothing personal graphic with a fucking bald eagle with a weird thing literally, on it or whatever yeah. <laughs> like just just a note a vague description of literally it. yes i have like i'll have like i don't know like uh oh we gotta do an ashley ashtray or you know hmm let, let's think about five good water bottle ideas mm. you know what i mean do, do we need to make a water bottle just shit like that right but is it tempting when you have a product do good like the Ashley Ashtray, which sold out right away, I guess, mm -hmm. or, you know, the Perk 30 jersey? Is it tempting to be like, oh, fuck, if I put this on my online store and make like, you know, 40 fucking thousand of these this year, then I could probably make a couple million bucks. Yes. That's got to be tempting, right? Now I think that, you know what I mean? 
<clears throat> for a while, I mean, it's a little bit harder with these accessories because with T-shirts, you know, you can have them on your site. You could, you know, concurrently keep printing them. But with these guys, like, they want, like, they want for you to order a minimum of 500. You know what I mean? If you want another 1,000, it's going to take six months. So mm. it's a little bit harder with the accessories, but I am trying to get to that point because <clears throat> I look, I don't really believe in the whole hype shit anymore, bro, where, mm. where it's like, I, I don't think that the, the fact that it's on the website or is on the website, like, really, like, the demand definitely does change, but you have brands like Balenciaga, where of course you know they're they're, they're miles away from what I'm at, what I'm doing, but like they could, they could release that sock runner shoe for three years mm. and it's still a popular shoe. You get it at Nordstrom, you get it online. You don't have to fucking scurry through Grailed and Stock X with that they, kind of shit. But they keep iterating on it, right? Like they can't just keep doing it because at a certain point you got like Fila making the same shoe with their logo on it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, sure, sure. But I mean, Chinatown Market for one, you know, with that smiley basketball, they sell that shit at Foot Locker, but mm. people still love that shit. You think that? But do you worry about that? Would you put your shit in Tillys or Zoomies or whatever? Oh yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Really? I mean, I don't really have a reason reason to i would do it i would do it in the like it had to be some deep shit you feel me like the fact that like when i was in ninth grade i was shopping at zoomies it gotta be some i'm not gonna drop like the fentanyl shirt or like some nice jacket there <laughs> they don't want mean? the fentanyl shirt i'm assuming probably not <laughs> that'd probably be a bad day at and, the office. and this is another thing where people were just like man you shouldn't drop that bro it, it, it's way too deep mm. i be getting deep with my shit sometimes yeah <laughs> Yeah. Do you, do you ever have ideas that you think are great, but they're too fringe and people oh, don't get yeah. it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, 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 I don't. You know, to be real with you, I'll, I'll have my gut moments where it's like something like this or like the SpongeBob, where it's like you can't tell me no, I'm gonna do it. Mm. But there are things where I, I do go through like a 50 man fucking checklist of like just vibe checking everybody. Like, yo, is this good? Yeah. And I've trained everybody around me to be fucking like dead honest, like almost be fucking mean to me, like mm. tell me like Blasi, this is the worst shit you ever seen. You're really. Like, yeah. Do you think you need that? You need somebody yeah, to be critical bro. of your shit? I, like, I hate, because I, I saw so many yes men just being in these group chats or in these email threads with designs where it's like, you send it, everyone on the team's like, oh, I don't know. Ugh. And then the, the main guy's like, yo, this is sick. I'm like, oh, I see it. It's mm. dope. I got so tired of seeing that shit from third point perspective. I tell everybody, like, look, bro, like, I'll, I'll budge you in into this, like, creative you know dot conversation that i want to have to help me make more shit but you gotta be dead honest or you know i could be talking to a mirror i'd rather do that than fucking waste my time doing this shit what are you throwing some of these ideas you have at your team like are, are, do you have an idea every and day you just, you just say yo brian do this mm, no i mean like i'll 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 let it sit in my head sometimes it's one of those like light bulb moments where yeah like fuck what we got going all hands on deck but there's a lot of things where it's like, let me develop that. Let me sleep on it. Let me work on shit. Um, it's a project project basis for sure. Well, so what are they doing for the most? They always have shit that is in mind or are yeah, they working well, on random shit out of their own brains as well? So shout out to Runts. When I when I really started getting in with them last year, they you know they told me like, what are you doing, Blasi? Like, you got to have at least an assistant. So I got that a week later. Like, yo, we have all these projects we want you to work on. You're only one guy, bro. We need you to have like four people. And uh, the weed, the, the weed game. I just want to tell y'all, it's it's the realest game. People want to. Th that's the only market where people find a reason to spend five bands to get fifteen bands. Mm. Music, er, you know, a rapper gets everything for free. They they think about shit and they get paid twenty k. Fashion, it has that. I'll I'll, I'll do it myself. Uh, state of mind. So with with weed, it kind of offered a whole new uh, business for me where it's like I could ha just have this shit on autopilot and I can have my whole team make some money off of it, be able to pay their own bills while it's still working out for me. Right. And like through that, it kind of like, you know, they got, they got plenty of agency work every, every week. You know what I mean? Even on the private depart, even on the private side, like I said, I think I posted like twice ever like, yo fucking, this is my graphic price hit me up, but I never do that shit generally speaking but if you were kind of dry on work you could just sort of put it out there doesn't and get, it doesn't get that dry because you have so many consistent clients well umg and phase we talk on a weekly basis along shout out to desto dub you know he's another client that's off law cops there we we talk every week okay there it's probably like another like dozen clients like that so like i sometimes it's too much for us mm. you know what i mean where it's like fuck we all got things to do today and we all got things to do for our week like all my designs got brands but like I tell them like this, it's like, bro, you got to do it like me. Like, you got to let these agency work, just fund your, your fucking office, fund fund what you want to do so you don't hold your brand to a point where it's like, I got to make money. Fuck it, 50% off today, guys. Right. But if those contracts disappeared, would you be fucked or would nah, you be like, I'm fuck, in. our energy can just go in other directions? No. Nah. Like, you're not really like beholden to like one big job, are you? I'm NBA Blasi, bro. Never broke again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... 
shit, knock on wood, but like since 2016, where those 10 bucks or 10,000, you know what I mean? There's always going to be someone there that's going to want uh, work, whether, you know what I mean? If, if let's just say tomorrow everyone's like, yo, vote if Blasi shit's weak and everyone just decides no, sorry, yes, then fuck it. You know what I mean? Time to go into a new industry, but like I don't see that shit coming anytime soon. Uh, how like, does people getting <clears throat> added to your design team work? Like, do they just DM you and say, this is my work, check my shit out, and you just end up seeing it at some point? Or how do you add people to the team? Now it's a little hard because of no jumper. I'm not yeah. gonna lie, because like prior to this, it was just my life, yes. it was just a streetwear audience. So everyone mm. on there is just hanging me up for like streetwear shit. Now I got kids like, oh my god, I watch Disconnected. Right. Yo, where's house phone? But like all my designers, I met them like, I think all of them, I paid them for the first time of their lives. Mm. Like most of these kids, like I have one who I picked up when he was 16. He's from like fucking a mile from where I was from. So I'm like, let me put him on game. I have another person who learned Photoshop while he was doing, while he was, you know, started fucking with me. Now he does shit for NASCAR and all that. Right. And I, I have another guy who like, just the same thing, was working a dead end job. And, you know, I mean, I just found through Instagram, all of them. Does it, Cause at this point, does a day at work where it's just you grinding away on the computer feel like not that productive? Because if you have like, you know, eight other artists who are all working on ideas that'll eventually oh, make yeah. you money and be associated with your brand, that's got to feel like real productivity once you have the whole team grinding. Yeah, right? no, I love my team, bro. And I only want it to grow more, you know, but yeah. it is it, it's getting harder and harder to uh, to figure out, you know, who do you want to add and, you know. I, I really think we got the formula down, so it's like the next person is going to be important. But like, because you know, having eight people in an office is one thing, and having like forty people is a totally different I thing that would take so much more management. That'd be crazy. <laughs> God forbid, or God willing, I you know, forty people sounds crazy. Like I, I'm still very much an introvert. You can't catch me at no party. You can't catch me outside. I'm inside all day long. Mm. You know what I mean? So you're not trying to like scale it. Like your your ideal vision oh, for this yeah. business. Would you want it to be ten times? bigger it, no it, it will get to that point but whether like me sharing an office with 40 people i can't do that mentally mm -hmm. well they don't have to be there right but yeah at some point you can hire people to like be administrating and you know we working with them do well, you have that already yeah we we have somebody you know what i mean by fucking down near my assistant i trained him to be my manager mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean and now he has somebody under him you mm -hmm. know what i mean D doing all the uh petty work i had him doing last year because it's weird for me because sometimes i'll have days where i'm doing like four interviews in a day and then in terms of like making money immediately that might be the best thing that i could do that day creating all this content but then at the same time i could also be spending the day reviewing new hosts and like mm -hmm. trying to find you know new personalities who could do something for the brand even designers should fucking people who could be on camera whatever and that might be able to like if i find one good person that could be a person that's bringing in so many millions of views every month or whatever like one good person that i find could be doing so much more than what I'm able. So exactly. it's, I, I go back and forth a lot in terms of like what, where my time is best spent. It's worked out for you pretty well, bro. You but know what yeah, I mean? but I, I feel like I still haven't really started trying to find talent. I've just kind of let like a handful of them fall into my lap, yeah. you know? And it's like, I still haven't really like gone out of my way to like really do this. And that's one thing with the store. I want to do these live streams where like if it's me, you and house phone kicking in the back of the store for four hours and we're able to talk to all these people who come into the store and like talk to them and like exactly. have them show us their work or whatever. That would be the illest shit to like be able to kind of have the store have this like recruiting element to it where yes. we're able to meet way more people and make content out of it and have the people at home be able to witness it. I mean like I, I think someone who did it right was Ice Poseidon around that time? Mm. Just because when he was doing the the IRL streams, like he was doing those those those, uh, those those streams where he was just finding, you know, the butler and and Lucha gets introduced, and you all know of a sudden mean? he's got ten personalities that the people exactly. give a fuck about. And he tried to like make a real consistent business out of that, but he wasn't able to. He wasn't able to wrangle it, you know, because the IRL streaming itself is untenable like yeah. there's just things that are going to happen once you get famous enough especially if you're like him where you're kind of toxic or yeah. whatever where it's just not gonna it's not gonna be able to work in the long run you it, know? you're gonna get to the point where it the authority is just gets involved tells you you can't film anymore yeah that's what happened to him right he just got like banned from los angeles county like yo you're you're not allowed to step outside with your camera at all it's been too many calls <laughs> he just had trolls and redditor people after him to such an insane extent that him living here just became like impossible and in comparison 
Twitch streaming and doing podcasting, it's like a much, much more controlled environment. You right, know? Right. And it's like AD has been incredible for the podcast, but like then the T-Rail thing is crazy. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden what you guys is doing is sick. And it's like sharp. Yeah. You find these people and you just fucking, you know, that could just be like the best thing. Are you trying to find with. like your, uh, your next just like full blown cold email, like personality kind of thing? I mean, I, I'm just trying to like stay open minded, you yeah. know, and see the potential in people too. Because sometimes like with the Flacco kid, I don't think he's fully formed. I think that like if he's on camera doing stuff with us for a couple of years, that he will become like so much better. Right. And that's the weird thing about it is it's the same thing with a rapper where if you want to sign a rapper early on, you just have to be able to look at their potential and not what they've actually right. done. You have to be able to imagine them with the Amiris on. And that, yeah, exactly. And, and that's part of me finding a designer. It's like, I'm more interested in finding like the kid, you know what I'm saying? Right. Who, who could, who could, who could risk, you know, these next couple of months making, you know, a thousand or two a month mm. versus, you know, hiring somebody who's, you know, a, a highly polished guy. He comes with, you know, looking for his 1099 already, right. you know, um, but I, I'm, I'm always here to respect and like honor just dope creatives. And that's why I look for is just someone who's just who's willing to work. And like, I, I want to see a little bit of me when I was like grinding in them. Could you like look at someone, see them not really having that much talent? But the personality and the potential, you just could like that makes you want to fucking train them and get them in that yeah. realm because you know that the creativity like because that's the weird thing with design is it's like you could have the best ideas ever. But until you actually know how to use Photoshop, like I'm not I'm someone who never learned to use Photoshop. I learned to use Final Cut and I learned to like, you know, but just in terms of the design shit, like it just never really clicked with me. And I tried like I tried to fucking take classes for Photoshop and shit, but just never really like actually dedicated it to myself. So I've never been able to like you, you, you can't see what an Adam 22 graphic might look right, like. Right, right. Because I never learned to speak that language. And, and that's you know? the thing. It's like I think I think creativity is really something that you just teach. Like mm. I truly feel like maybe 10 percent just like aren't creative and just vanilla but i think a majority of the people it's like it's like you know weightlifting and shit you know you just you, you you keep uh teaching yourself creative you know lessons and you just get better and better but learning these these tools like photoshop or these instruments that's what's going to help you get to the next level you know yeah definitely you, you could be the coldest graphic designer we probably don't even know it <laughs> i know is that weird to think about that like because i never learned to speak the language because it would be so much more interesting to have that conversation right. even if my shit was basic as fuck to just be like like look at this graphic i whipped yeah. up yeah i had an idea the other day i told my girl about and it really reminded me of why i don't trust my own vision what was it? i was like it's like a bouquet of flowers and it's gonna say in cursive at the bottom a bundle of grundles <laughs> and then the flowers on the tips, instead of like the flower bud, it'll be like a grundle. But I was What's like, a grundle? The space between your ball sack and your asshole. But that's the problem is it's the gooch? it does yeah, yeah. It's like what does it look like? It's like you don't really know because it's it's like nothingness. Yeah. But somehow, like, I don't know. But right then, vision, like, I, I'm like, wrong this is mission. it's a stupid idea. But it's like that's that was my idea. Yeah. I, I have I have one similar that I'm like trying to grind out out of my head, like Instead of DHL or mm -hmm. DHK, I want to make like a dead homie shirt. That's funny. I think I've honestly texted you that. Like, yeah, you did. I think, yeah. <laughs> said DHL. We, I, but we're going to do a DHZ shirt and we got to like get the approval of the Hoovers because like Treyway is coming for his percentage on that. Really? I don't know. Who, who's claiming dead homies? I don't know, but they're the ones who always write DHZ, right? Shout out to Thirsty P, owner of Dead Homies Clothing Brand. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a clothing brand called that. See, that's a good brand name that I wouldn't have the balls to do. That's uh, yeah. I remember I told I told me and Phoenix had a whole conversation about how how, how hard that name is. Hard. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I I feel like I want to stay far away from the gang shit graphically. Yeah, me and my homie have talks about that. Like, there's no longer there's streetwear, but there's there's also trapwear now. Mm. You know what I mean? Define that. Awful lot of cough syrup. Oh, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Okay. Dead homies. You know what I mean? Shit like that. But like, I'm, I'm not discrediting them. They're still hard. But it's shit people you, you'll see like, you know, selling Zaza yeah. wearing this shit. You feel me? Definitely. Where it's like a, the cough syrup is like a stand in mm -hmm. for like selling Zaza. <laughs> exactly <laughs> like it could be the same thing it's like, like clearly being sold in like, the same scenario yeah if an undercover cop wanted to do like some 21 jump street but with like mm. modern day you'd, you'd have the hoodie on you know what i mean yeah you'd have some gallery department pants and maybe some like weird like instagram babes but you know what's funny is like the more the bigger you get the more shit you can't do like 
even mm-hmm. like like for myself personally i remember like people would always be coming through the store with like shirts with like lean pints and like you know asap yams on it and yeah. shit or like all the like supreme logo whatever like all this bootleg ass shit that i'm just looking at it like wow i could not do that like yeah. if i made that they would be on my ass do you feel that that though do you feel like you have to stay away from copyright infringement i think i'm still uh flying under the radar mm. i know it'll happen one day but like i understand like the creative legal system and the process like they usually just tell you send your friend a letter like yo dope shit but like take it down yeah or we're gonna get lawyers on you they'll, they'll usually do that because it is also expensive for them to you know hire a lawyer and whip up this fucking crazy ass email Email. Right, um, but it hasn't happened to me yet. You, know what you I mean? haven't even got one cease and desist for activity. Like in 2018, we did like a Chucky shirt, uh. like, but that was literally it, and that was me and my brand. I just did the graphic for it, but like for nothing personal, like the bank bobs and the fucking well, knock on wood, but like all, all those th- that bank uh, knit that I, that that I gave you, yeah, all those banks. All in the back of my head, I'm like, mm, this might be the one, but nah. And then I'm gonna keep rocking it until they uh, uh, until they really keep start knocking it. Yeah, you know. You think House Phone's got a date with Destiny with Nike? Uh, he think he's paranoid. He thinks he is, but like I'm gonna keep it real with you, bro. Like they're not they're not gonna start knocking until they start seeing like until there's like millions of dollars worth of like taking. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Nike's very very much like you know they they're looking for the big fish. But how much are you involved with that shit? With what? Like, did you have is is him doing uh, high high rollers? Is that all with the the coup dude, or is it? Yeah, that's with coup. But like, I mean, with all my friends, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Like, I see anybody with a platform, I'm gonna like tell them. I told Yuri, like, bro, you have to start a brand. You know, this is you're missing out on income. And they got to the point where I told House One, look, bro, I'll design this shit. You know, the shit we did back in October, I did like eight pieces with my team with them. And I told him, like, look, bro, I gotta fucking throw this shit in your face. Pay me out the back end. Let me show you what it could do. And it did really great. They couldn't believe it. So now we're working on more shit. But like, I try to plant seeds like that with everybody I meet. Right. But House Phone would be doing his brand without you if you didn't have any involvement or you you basically like got him off his ass in that regard? I, I, I don't know if I can credit myself. You don't myself. want to take full control? I, I fucking yeah. made House Phone make <laughs> high credit, rollers. Just a little credit? Shit, I'll, I'll take I'll take 5%, you know what I mean? Mm. I, but he inspired me, you know what I mean? He, he, was, he, he gave me my first thousand followers. Really? Yeah, I, I, he shouted I, you out and got you there. Yeah, man, some bullshit bedazzled shoes and like he was like, "Yo, uh, get Blasi to a thousand. I had like eight hundred followers. Wow. Yeah, pulled it to him in the fucking hood. That's the fucking come up that you see a lot now is kids will like make something dope, figure out how to get to a celebrity or a rapper or whatever, mm-hmm. bring it to them, present it to them, get the video, get the tag. All of a sudden, boom, you're in the game. You got a picture. You yep. giving Gunna some shoes that you customized, exactly. and boom, you're in the game. That that might be like the easiest way to like get in, not even in a bad way, but like if any designers or any people who like want to like be creative or like do some shit, just fucking make some custom pieces for some rappers, yeah. hunt them down, and you know then get your tag off. Then you know now you got a nine to five. But it's funny because when you're not custom enough, you end up with this situation with the three <laughs> the three no jumper rugs. <laughs> like oh, I, it's kind of crazy because we didn't ask for those. Like three different fans sent in no jumper rugs. That are almost the same. One is big and one is lighter orange. I want to see. And they are fire. And shout out to the people who sent them yeah. in. But maybe that idea wasn't creative enough no. to stand out since there are three. In the new office, I definitely want to see a whole wall of just like the the twenty six like no jumper rugs and just the variation just of oranges, rugs. <laughs> different border widths. You know, maybe one's off white. You have more rugs in the works. So it was the perk thirty jersey, or the perk rug. No, you didn't do the rug. You did no. the jersey. No, yeah. I Who just did the did rug? The uh, fuck, I forgot this kid's name. Right. Oh no, it was some dude from uh, uh from like Arizona. Fuck, I forgot. Bro knows who he is, but I forgot his name. But like, he was just a small time dude, and not. I, I was trying to have, I was trying to fuck with him on some more design work. He was hella creative, but um, you know, the fact he lives in Arizona, just I, I couldn't work with him. Really, you, know, you can't but, do remotes too hard. No, no, I, you need to be at the office. We need to laugh at the same shit. Um, you, I gotta introduce you to OTM music. You know what I mean? Uh, like, you listen to that that much? <laughs> yeah, my wow. office fucking hates it. But Damn. I, man, shout out to Off the Muscle, man. Damn, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in in your office, like. How big is it? And because you just upgraded, right? Like, what? Why did it need to be so much bigger? Um, I mean, we'll check it out. So you were downtown, right? Yeah, I, I was in the fashion district. I was on 14th Street, um, near like where they sell all the flowers and shit. And uh, a lot of bums out there. Yeah, no. And what's crazy is like, so we were 
like if you want to diss me you could have said skid row we really weren't but okay. like we were on like the outer ring we're all like the my uh, store was actually skid row yeah fifth I, and I, los angeles was a base it's right on the edge but it's yeah. basically in it no you're dead you're like across the street from that police station yeah whatever. where that's like, like a block sketchy away, yeah. weird one yeah but anyways which uh, makes it sound safe but it actually has the opposite effect it's crazy because <laughs> skid row is a community of outcasts right but yeah. like this outer layer was like the outcast of skid row yeah and there's a lot of transsexual prostitutes which is you're into that Specifically, right? no. Oh, no, that's why we, they asked why we got the spot. No, but specifically, that was like the specific uh demographic in our area. Um, j j just a side note, but anyways, we had this office for a whole year, and as we were done with our lease, the, the lease manager says, Yo, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to stay. They're like, We actually found somebody that's gonna, uh, you know, like take over the spot after you. So I was kind of like, I had to find a new spot, and this was the new place. It, it's a lease for three years, so like, Where is I want it still downtown. Into, yeah, it's still in okay. downtown. Better area, or way better area. Okay, way better. I don't even want to like say my neighbors, but my neighbors have like a very popular facility. Okay, where they have like security guards by the fucking trucks okay. outside. And how much space do you have? How much do you need? Like, does, do all you guys have offices or are they all like working around a big I, table? I, I have my own office where it's like maybe like the size of this room. Um, and it's also like the conference room. And then my designers have a space that's about like, I'm going to say like a quarter of this space. Right. Where it's like three desks. And because none of them smoke, right? And like, I, I got my Runs gang over. You know what I mean? I got fucking Hesh rolling his fifth backwood. You let Hesh hang out? Hell yeah. Hesh is with me like every other day. I'm not going <laughs> to wow. lie. Because cause th that's, that's the lot. thing. But check it out. Me and Hesh be so on it. It's like he'll find me like, yo, Blazzy, I got a weed guy who who wants, you know, 3,000 bags or some shit like that. You know what really? I mean? Yeah, because we were like runs. I just want to say one thing. Like we were the ones who started the whole die cut bags. You know what I'm saying? And for a while, you know, shout out to Nick. He was the uh, which is the owner, one of the owners of runs. He was the only one. I was doing production, so for a majority of last year, if you wanted to get custom bags, you had to go through us. You know what sucks about runs? What? Is that I was looking at my DMs and I fucking see that they hit me up to interview LB Bro, in 2018. You, listen, you got. And I was asleep. Yeah, no, you got to interview LB because you really. Because I was watching another interview he did the other day, and I fucking love this dude. And I sent it to Dub, yeah. and I was like, bro, this dude is your fucking twin because you guys have, like, the same story, yeah. the same mannerisms, everything. He's, he's, like, he's like, that is my twin. He's electrifying, bro. And, like, yeah. he shout out to young LB. He's somebody who, like, saw my team. Like, a lot of people like to bullshit about, like, funding things, but he's, he's dropped five figures with me. You right. know what I mean? Where it's, like, Blasi, like, we talk on a, you know, we were always working on some shit every month. Right. Um, but LB, bro, you got to uh, interview him just because it's like you have Burner, which is like the fucking, I guess, from the outside. I'm, I still feel like I'm an outsider in this weed shit, but like he's kind of like the godfather, the, the, the fucking the president of this shit. But you also have the people who like, you know, we're in, we're in the runs era right now. It's the exotic era. And LB's the face of this shit. Yeah. Like you, no one, like he don't, like you have to talk to him. You know what I'm when saying? When I was watching that interview, I was like, "Holy shit!" He like gets the like. He's so smart. Feet to the fucking sidewalk part of that marketing so much. I, I gotta put you onto a documentary. You're gonna be like, "What's it called?" It's just the the. It's like a 20 minute runs documentary about how they started and the fact that like he was really a foot soldier. Like he he was following Playboy Cardi's tour bus right. just to just to perform and also get his runs brand out there. Yeah, it started on that Playboy Cardi tour like in. 2017 i have so much respect for like like there's so many lives that i didn't get a chance to live but that when i look at it i kind of like could have imagined myself getting into that and mm -hmm. being good at it like if i had like figured out doing a weed brand like early on i could just like have imagined like killing it like exactly. the, you know like like no i don't want to like act like i could have done it. like he did it yeah but like like when i think about podcasts i'm like successful wow business yeah i'm like i fucking took that energy to like podcasting right. but when i look at zach i'm like holy fuck like ftp is where if you take that like 100 percent dedication to building a brand mm -hmm. that's what it looks like yeah you know yeah that and that's definitely what lb got going on but i responded to runs like they're just a regular weed brand where it's like yeah hit this email if you want to advertise or whatever <laughs> that's fucking <laughs> Which 2018 probably too i probably should have yeah. known no, no, I, I think you might have been a little too early. I, yeah. I keep it real. I, it it was all the TJ and Casher Quan bars that did it for me. I'm like, okay, that like did he, help cement it. Didn't he, it? he said, uh, "This some V loan runs. Fuck a V loan hoodie." And mm. I was like, "Damn!" And then I, 
Everybody rapping about fake runs, I felt like was a huge part of making me like want to know more about runs. And that's a, you you can't just the like, idea that it was being bootlegged. You cannot you cannot pay a fucking little baby gunna to promote your shitty weed brand. That's really just off the muscle. Like mm. that that's really just them fucking with what they had going on. Like it's gone to the point where like I'm thinking I'm like clever and I'm gonna put them onto a song that says runs and they're gonna blow their mind. They don't even bat an eye at that shit anymore. Yeah. Where it's like you know a Kodak will drop it in a bar, no cap. You, yeah, you know or fucking rilo rodriguez or you know any any rapper whether it's west coast oh jeezy would mention it it it's if anyone's dropping an album there might be a run spar i right. heard the new 42 doug estg there's like six of them oh yeah easy you know what i'm I saying even listen to it i can tell you that it's yeah. really good really i fuck with it 42 doug's probably like that. my favorite rapper really right now yeah interesting i fuck with him I, and, uh, I, I remember I spent like a whole Sunday getting ready to interview him and then he bailed at the last minute. Yeah, he comes off as a bailer for sure. <laughs> but like, um, yeah, he he has a really cold uh, discography. Like the last three albums he's dropped. Yeah, he's hard. Yeah, for Hopefully, sure. Maybe I'll get that one day. Oh, yeah, you got to, bro. Fingers crossed. Oh, yeah. How much does the music have to do with like inspiring your shit, though? A hundred percent. I think, like, like I said, bro, at one point I thought I wanted to be the fucking the rapper. You know what I'm saying? And then it really got to the point where... I I uh, uh, I just used it to do designs and like you know my main inspiration is music. I'll listen to Rio de Young OG while I'm designing, and that helps me come up with creative bars. Mm. You had you had a disaster here. Yeah, I, I think I ran into him before we did uh, disconnected one day, and I told him thank you. And uh, I told him, like, bro, like, your bars inspire me so much. I come up with the craziest shit. He was like, oh, you rap or something? Like, no, I, I make graphics. I, I'm a designer. Right. But it's like, when, when you hear just the, you, when you hear creativity, it's going to inspire your life, even if you are or aren't a rapper, you right. know? And I, still to this day, a great deal of my inspiration is music. And just like, I don't know, I fuck with that shit. Do you even have enough space or enough time to, like, hone in on all the different ideas that you're kind of chasing in your head? Yeah. I think so. I mean, like, I've gotten to a point where, like, I'm a visual person. There's hella whiteboards and fucking, like, cork boards at my office. And shit gets printed. Like, I literally have a sheet where it's just a whole, you know, uh, a traffic grid where it's like, do I have a lot of ideas? How many of those ideas are in production? Mm -hmm. How many of those are at ready to drop? You know what I mean? And then we start realizing where the bottleneck's at. But um, I have confidence that, like, you know, I, I I finally have matched my amount of designers with my amount of production people. Right. So now I have two people who that's what they do for me all day long. It's just look for products and help me, you know, actualize these things. Like most of the shit we're doing for the first time, Ashley, the fucking piggy banks, all that shit, you know, just doing it for the first time. Do you aspire to find products that you're going to make like consistently, like over and over and yeah. over and like always change it? Or do you see them being like a product that you just consistently well, do? Well, I'll, I'll let everybody know, like Ash on me, Ashley is probably my biggest mistake as a designer, just because it's like, I only made 250 of those, but that, mm. th that th that's the thing is like, you're designing and you're buying these MOQs in context of your career nine months prior. So you're thinking like, oh, you know, only 250, I could mm. easily sell a thousand of these. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we're, we are going to come out with a new colorway. How much were they? New, uh, they were, I think, 100 or 120, something like that. Okay. Did you feel like that was a, a big ask or did that feel no. safe? No. I mean, you can't find another ashtray in that market for that price. Really? I think so. And like, like I said, I'll, I only drop something and like that's why I'm very, you know, particular about what comes out if I feel like I would buy it. You know what I mean? Like I had to look at Ashley and be like, if you were at a store, if you were on Instagram, you saw that, would you get it? Do you spend okay. a lot of time thinking about pricing though, and like how how yeah, it's a how struggle. Demo, like what you're saying to the audience with how you price things. Yeah, there, there, there's like a alpha and a beta way of looking at it. I feel, or you know, that they say bullish or bearish in stocks, but like it's like you know, either you could create the market where it's like, nah, motherfuckers, my shirt's eighty dollars. Deal with it. Right. And they work for both people. Desto will tell you. And there's and then there's people where it's like, you know what. I'm going to sell these for $10. I want everybody to have it. Right. They both work, which makes it even more confusing. But, um, I, you know, I, I just think about like how I was when I was 15, 16 or when I was like 20 and broke, where it's like if I'm going on a website, it's almost like immediate, especially as a kid who only has like less than a thousand dollars to go from less to high on right. the option. So you want to look for the if you're on Balenciaga, you want to look for the sixty dollar lanyard or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So and like as you get more money, you lose more sense of like how people actually like like in terms of weed. I remember like having that conversation every time I talked about selling weed and realizing that 
the way that me and the people I kick it with buy weed is very different than the average person. The average person is like way more price sensitive mm -hmm. when it comes to weed. And you got to take that into consideration when you're selling weed. And, you know, you lose perspective on that as exactly. you do better for yourself. You know? And that's why that's why I try to keep like I know like most of my most of my audience is like they're just a Hispanic kids from the hood. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm not sure if they're necessarily going to have five hundred dollars for a leather jacket. You know right. what I mean? But like I'm, I'm definitely focused on making products that are affordable. But that, mm -hmm. that's like I'm not trying to like I'm not trying to be the two hundred dollar guy. You know, what I mean, sometimes th this this looks like a hundred dollars to me. You know, what right. I mean, so I'm gonna drop it as such. But even for like those bank bobs I did, the piggy bank, like I sold those for sixty, but I had people from both sides telling me like, "Blazy, you're stupid. That's a hundred fifty dollar item at least." Or, "Blazy, are you kidding me? Thirty dollars? What's up with you?" Right. You know what I mean? How much do you usually sell shirts for? Forty. Forty. Yeah. And do you do you respect the fact that some people in your position might just be like mm, eighty? Yeah, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Because like at the end of the day, they don't got what I got going on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like they're they're only selling eighty shirts. Are they selling eighty graphics that week? Do you watch Gifted Hater on YouTube? Gifted Hater, yes, the, the, the skateboard guy. Yeah, he he like had a whole thing where he was like calling out this like girl skateboard company for selling like I think it was thousand dollar or fourteen hundred dollar pants, and they were super basic pants with just a little tag, and like. You know, yeah. that this is like that, that but they that is them kind of like putting the cart before the horse, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you haven't built the kind of brand that gets to charge right. fourteen hundred dollars for pants. Yeah, and it, it's very interesting, like thinking about like gallery department or Mike and Mary who are at those dollar thousand dollar price points is like, were you at sixty dollars at one point, or did you just like j just go like big boy and say like a thousand dollars, deal with it, one sell a month? I mean, the gallery should. Is super basic, right? The yeah. Amiri shit I could see because with all those patches and shit, a lot of the time, like yeah. it, it just looks expensive. Like from my understanding, probably of, some premium fabrics for show. Right, but I mean, yeah, because like for me, gallery department, like I don't know where the fuck that came from. All of a sudden, everybody rocking it. I got no clue yeah. why. It came out like the last two years. You're, I don't know what store it's in. Listen, Adam, as a fashion person, I'm on the same <laughs> shit as you. I don't know where the fuck this shit came from, but like, <laughs> there's so many brands like that, like. The other day, I fucking went to uh, Saks or some shit, and I seen hella purple. And yeah. then all of a sudden, I realized, like, damn, all these rappers are rocking purple in these videos yeah. and shit, and I didn't realize Purple's it Purple's another one. Like, where the fuck did that come from? I don't know. I could do, like, five minutes of Google and probably figure it out, but... Man, Bransby just popping out. But all the rappers just wear the most expensive shit at the fucking department store. Like, it seems like yeah. what it looks like almost doesn't matter at all. It doesn't. I, I feel like at this point, it's just like the idea of like, ooh, that's Balenciaga shirt. I don't, don't know where Palm Angels came from. No, That's I, another one. It, it was like already played out by the time I like saw it in the store and was like, oh, this is where they get that. Well, what it really is, and like I didn't really start figuring it out until like I went into the industry, but it's a lot of people who had successful brands six, seven years ago that just want to rewash and like make a whole new brand. And, oh, yeah. But they have all those Barney's relationships and mm. they know they know the little babies and shit. Do you, do you carry the house phone v loan beef with you? No. <laughs> you know what? I, but I did call him. I did call him when, when I linked up with Bari. You know, shout out. Oh, you did link up. Yeah, shout out to v loan House phone was like kind of dissing him the other day. And I was like, I thought you guys squashed it. And then he basically acknowledged in the same breath that they did squash it. Yeah, I mean, that's just house phone. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> He like forgot for a minute. Probably, yeah, for sure. <laughs> shout out to house phone. But uh, no, when, when I met up with, uh, before I met with Bari, I called house phone. I'm like, yo, um, they hit me up for some work. Can I you have a problem with that? He's like, nah, nah, it's all good. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I was on my way. Right. I pulled up to his crib. He's playing like a samurai game for like three hours. Bari was. Yeah. So you're sitting there talking to him and he's just playing a sam samurai game? It was just me and him just working on like Juice World uh, weekend V Loan merch. Oh, wow. And you're, do you do that often where you're just sitting there with a, another person just? designing in front of them sometimes like i've because now like starting off like you you don't have the courage to tell somebody like uh leave me alone but like i, I start fucking i start telling them like look bro you, do you do this at a restaurant you know what i mean like do you do you go to the do you go to the oven and make sure the fucking the cookies like 50 percent done right. you know what i mean <laughs> um but but it's got to be effective in terms of making something that they like yeah, being I, able to just get feedback in real time so you're not working on something for an yeah. hour that they don't like right yeah and it, it was helpful because every step of the way i was talking to and you know and it's, it was good to know that he was fucking with it and he was like he, he was liking what it what, what it became and right. it, it went very good it's weird because you always have that option to do the sort of like clout muncher ass thing and like go pull up on people and be around them and like get around them to like further your business or whatever but yeah. it's like 
to me, it's kind of unsustainable. Like I could be pulling up on different rappers every night in the studio, but I don't feel like I really get a lot out of that. No, yeah. Same I mean, thing. I could be in the club every night. If I meet hella people. Right, right. If it's I don't up, know. if it's up to me, I'm gonna want. I'm just gonna go in there for the meeting, talk for 20 minutes. I might not even show my laptop. And then just go on to my way. But if I got to do it, if it's crunch time, they're like, hey, he need to be here. Mm. And I'll pull up. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's work. Do you out all night or are you like now be in the crib? I, no, I'm never out. Like literally, bro. Like I'm, I'm just at the office and at my crib on weekends. I will be at my crib from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. doing edibles and smoking weed. <laughs> <You just chill? laughs> Taking baths. <laughs> so if there's a girl you're fucking with, it's like, hey, come through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, they like, come to you. You don't go pull up to the to the trap spot. <laughs> nah. Stop I mean, it. Shit, nah. I mean, but I don't, I don't invite like. He's laughing. Shit, they might go to the office. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or I, I might get a hotel. I don't know. But um, on the weekdays, how late are you in the office? It's not like they're planning a lick on me right no, now. No, <laughs> no. I just want to know like what I'm hours are you, you in there? Because from my perspective, like Sometimes, I used to be in the store like noon to midnight yeah. every night and now i'm in here like 11 to noon to like six maybe yeah. seven uh, i usually get in around like 11 a.m i'll leave around like depending what i got going on i'll leave at like 12 or like at 4 a.m but really? sometimes there's been days where it's like sure i got like a full apartment you know five miles from my office but i'll just sleep there i'll be like man fuck this shit. you got a couch Hell yeah, good couch. Good I got couch. I got a couch. I got, got a bean bag. Yeah, mm. I got I got hammocks in there. But you can wake up in the morning and not shower. Yeah, I'll bust the Yuri. <laughs> bust the Yuri real quick. I guess I could do that, but I don't know. You're you're on some like grind mode, like tigerish shit. Like I'm a fucking working all day. But I could take it so much further than I have. And yeah. I, I'm like really holding back on that. But I don't know. Yeah, there's something about that morning shower that I feel like really gets me like like I need to like shower and put on new clothes in order to feel like, OK, this is the start of the day. Oh, yeah. No, this, this is the one I'm doing every day. But uh, like, you know, every like every two weeks, you know, you got I, a toothbrush at the office. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I can't even I would feel like I, I wouldn't even be able to work properly if I knew like if I had a, I'm very self-conscious about that kind of shit. Mm. You know what I mean? Where do you feel like you're at in terms of your own personal relationship with fashion? Especially being that you're now making more money, you could buy all this fucking designer shit that you probably thought was cool when you were younger. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely dabbling into uh, uh, you know some designer drip, but like for the most part, you know, I'm still very much like I want to be wearing like all my homie shit. Like mm. I'm, I'm wearing my homie's shoes, I'm wearing my homie's pants. This is my shirt. This jacket is the only thing I really bought from a store. Okay, you know what I mean. But like, I really just want to like rep my homies. But I'm definitely tapping in with designer shit though. What are you wearing in the office? You wearing cool boots in the office, or are you wearing <laughs> slides? No, I'm, I gotta wear boots because you know what happened. And uh, sh you know, there's been several rappers. It's lame as shit to say, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, fuck, I don't feel just, I don't feel as confident as I would if I were to dress nice today. Really? Well, <laughs> yeah. today is one thing because you're on camera doing a podcast. But I don't know. For me, it's like, well, I mean, right here, this is all you need to know. Mm -hmm. It's so comfortable. I feel like, like. I feel like I'm better as an interviewer when I'm like really comfortable and like when I'm wearing shoes, I'm just less comfortable. Really? So I just feel like I kind of can't do it. Yeah. But it also like there is an extent to which like the rapper logic of like I'm going to wear my super fly fucking outfit while I'm in the studio, mm -hmm. even though I'm only around like three people, just because if I feel like I am this person, then maybe I'll make music that represents that better. That's what I do. <laughs> you feel like when you're clicking away on Photoshop, your boots matter? Yes. Um. Well, no. I mean, I've I've made shit in fucking boxers and flip flops. You know what I mean? But like, whenever I'm at, whenever I want to have a good day, like I'll I'll put on a cold fit. Whether I'm only seeing three of three of my guys I see every day, you know, all day long, and they don't give a fuck what I'm wearing. But it's like it does something to you mentally, and like you're more prepared to meet people. See, that's my other problem is I'll buy some flash shit, and then I'll just like only wear it for the podcast. And I'll take right. it off right after because I just don't even fucking like wearing it. But, but but in the context of conducting business, would you trust a designer if you pulled up in fucking, you know what I mean, like sweatpants under some shorts and shit? You know what I mean? I would respect them if they were dressed in like a simple, plain, respectable way. Right. Like white tee, decent looking pair of jeans, plain okay. shoes. But yeah, sweatpants and flip flops, ugh, that to me is kind of like you're not even like trying at all. Like I feel like yeah. a basic ass t-shirt and jeans and shoes is like 
the streetwear or like you know fashion etc hip hop equivalent of like a suit and tie yeah for it's sure. like standard like you have to be yeah. at that yeah and and don't get me wrong i'm not gonna like pull all my chains out just to work you know like mm. you know i'm not gonna wear leather pants or like wear like the the, the clunkiest shoes i could find but like you know i'll put some shit on you know what i'm saying i'll well, listen it's crazy because even when you're like the most successful person in the world like zuckerberg i mean the fact that he fucking wears like this stupid plain outfit yeah. like doesn't wear a suit and tie i mean they talk about it like every article about him every video piece about him it's like a thing that needs to be discussed like i was watching this elon musk documentary and he's wearing a suit and tie and it's like he's the richest man in the world and he still has to wear this uncomfortable annoying outfit because he has to play the part of being an important businessman right. and if he didn't everybody would perceive him as kind of a fucking jabroni yeah i think mark zuckerberg is getting inspired by like steve jobs and shit like that because yeah. like, i think when you do get to the point of like that icon that uh you do gotta like fucking become a cartoon or like a statue of yourself you know what i mean i was it's thinking like, about doing a youtube video like i wore the same clothes for a year and just wear like a white t-shirt plain blue jeans and like the same pair of shoes every day for a yeah. year and just see how that is for me because that's like what steve jobs did he found like his optimal outfit and then right. just did it over and over what would be your optimal outfit like like white tee plain jeans plain fucking well probably birkenstocks that's fire I, mean, I, I, I would know. probably like dress it up like a GTA character. Oh, I wear I wear the same outfit every day for a year, and it's like some stupid ass outfit. Yeah, <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah, there's a lot of people kind of doing that though. Like you know, like like Roy Purdy at a certain point just kind of like had to yeah dress the same every day in order to keep that thing up. Supreme Patty. He stopped doing it, and it's kind of like he's just a regular guy. He's not. Yeah, Supreme Patty had to wear that fucking headband for like a hundred years. That shit was so dirty. Ugh. <laughs> she was like crazy. It had to be. Well, I wonder if there was ever a real one. Did they make that? Uh, nah, I don't think they so. They never even made one real one? No, they, they uh, no, actually, they definitely did make the headband. How did Supreme Patty not get sued by Supreme? I don't know. Because I think at one point he also had that shit tatted on him. I, I, you know, maybe I, I hope that one day we come to a point where like Supreme does their like in 10 years from now, they do the Supreme Patty collab. They mm. just have him <laughs> fucking put lime in his eyes wearing like a box logo. Imagine if they did that. That would be sick. I could see them in the twisted world, like paint, because like he he was like, if if Steve will do it is little baby, uh, fucking <laughs> what what's his name? Uh, Supreme Patty was Young Thug. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like like he was like this crazy you know figure, and then like there there came somebody to harness it and like you know to make it really a manufactured product. Supreme Patty is Americana. Yeah. He's an important part of our cultural fabric. Yeah. Damn. Lil Xan, too. Lil Xan is definitely, you know, a Redwood staple. We did a Lil Xan's collab. I, honestly, I wanted to thank Whoop. you so much. Keith. Shit didn't really sell, I'm going to be honest Appreciate with you. Appreciate it, Kiki. It was like, we got it right at so the like, end. There was like a period of time where like everything Lil Xan would sell so good. Yeah. And then by the time we did the collab, it was like, nah. It was like, what year was this? I don't remember, but it was around the time that we put out the vlog where, where he was like dating Noah Cyrus. Oh, Noah Cyrus, yeah, yeah, you know, and that that got like two million views. We had a long ass line out the door of like fucking Blazzy's fucking nieces <laughs> waiting to meet Lil Xan, and uh, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah no, it didn't really sell too great. They weren't feeling the Xanarchy uh, basketball jerseys, really. Yeah, they they were feeling that Xanarchy hoodie though. There was like one specific design he had. That just like, I don't know, did it for Lil Xan. A every rapper, I feel like, even even Lil Pump, I feel like he had like, he. I don't know. Actually, Lil Pump's not a good uh, example for merch. <laughs> Do you he ever draw merch? L he Lil definitely Pump draw around. merch. It's a shirt around. But I don't remember anything like iconic enough that I remember it. You yeah. know? He should have got behind Desto back then, though. If he had been like really forward thinking, could you imagine if he had had like fully like got behind that brand and like realized what was going to happen i actually designed that's awful lot of sketch it wow last year but you're, you're not doing that's awful lot of birkins we were or that's an awful lot of trendsetters i didn't do the trendsetters <laughs> but i did tap into the quavo project sometimes i feel like he's gotten mad with some of these but oh yeah no that's sometimes what <laughs> they're a little far out <laughs> he'll have me he'll have me busy on some creative projects but you know what's crazy is that like people love him so much that even if he does some crazy ass collab i seen him on a story saying like 50k for a collab yeah 
I mean, he, I, I, I think he's looking at the, uh, the Obviously exotic he's not, weed. Char- he's not charging Quavo that, but no, they're just no. doing that for the love. But. Yeah, the, the, he's charging Joe from Carson. Yeah. Yeah, the 50 bands. But yeah. uh, shit, I believe it, if, if it's really, if, if they got really a, a plan in mind, they could make that, they could recoup that for sure. Mm. You feel like Coyle Ray's over? <laughs> I feel like Coyle Ray's <laughs> over. Um, shit, my perspective on Coyle Ray, I think that. Uh, um, I think she didn't know what she signed up for. I, th- I think there's a lot of confusion going around, you know, mm. within her team, within the community, within the culture. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, uh, I, I think I I give her credit for 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 hanging out though and holding it down because there's a lot of uh, you know female artists in particular who will just like fold. You know what I mean? You know what it feels like? It feels like how Putin fell for his own propaganda. Like he hires all these experts that are like yeah. afraid to tell him. That they weren't gonna just like easily trample the Ukraine, right? And I feel like Coilerae might have a few too many people around her that were like, "Nah, like <laughs> this right. album's gonna do." Like, I gotta actually listen to it, but it's crazy. Like, it just I don't know. Like, where where are her fan base? But like, it, they seem like they're out there. But with that being said, like, what what do you think is triggering all these album sales to just like generally like sell less and less year by year? Because at one point, a hundred k was like the standard. Like you doing something now, a hundred k is like like you gotta be the weekend to do some well, shit I mean, like that. Like the locks basically like didn't even get to put out a second album on Bad Boy because they didn't go platinum. You know, but that's in the era of the physical yeah, CD weight, release. Yeah. There's only like a couple dozen rap releases on major labels at that time, realistically. Whereas like now we, we talk about Lil Xan. Lil Xan did 28K and he was supposed to be hot. And then he did 28K and people acted like he was the biggest fucking bum on the face of the planet. But that was also the merch collab days. Which was milking. Bro, I, and that's what really had me busy around that time. Now Fabio Foreign does 28K and they're talking about it like it's a W. Right, right. I, I is it the fact that like maybe we're just absorbing so much of it through TikTok and we're like we only want the minute clip of it versus you know let me hear fucking A through Z on this album right here. That's you a know? huge part of it. I feel like there's a lot of Coil Ray fans that probably don't give a shit enough to go. You know, I watch I watch a video with Lil Durk, see what's going on with that. Right. I watch the Nicki Minaj collab, but I'm not really like thinking about the album. Right. And the album's a lot. Uh, album's a fucking it's an hour investment. usually, dude. It's for showing sure investment. Like, unless you really want... Like, I love Lil Durk. I ain't listening to this new album yet. I don't know why, but I just fucking haven't got around to it. And it's like there's three, four music videos. I'm right. assuming those are the best songs. Yeah, they, you know? they had a whole team behind them for sure. Yeah, I don't, but there's still artists, though, that are, like, pushing the envelope for me. Like, I, I really like what a Baby Stone Girl has got going on. Mm. I think that they're definitely the front runners right now with this this new L.A. landscape. But they're not doing crazy numbers yet, which is interesting to me. They're not, but in the context of, like, an L.A. artist coming up, like, if, if you see their peers, they're definitely getting, like, 40 to 50% more views. For having no support. Yeah, I mean, they have Empire you know. now behind them. Yeah. And, like, it's evident. Like, I was just driving through Koreatown the other day, <laughs> and I, I saw fucking Baby Stone Gorilla's posters. Like, we pasted on the wall. Really? Yeah. And, like, you, you go on the videos, and you go through the L.A. hood pages, and you could see, like, okay, you know, they, they got a team, and there's some money behind it now. But I think yeah. if there's any group out there right now that's, like, really pushing that out that came out the last two years, I think, I think they're definitely one of the stronger groups for sure. Do you care about putting on for LA do you feel like that's your responsibility yeah, for show sure. because like especially as a designer bro like when I was a kid there's nobody I could have looked at everybody who was from my side didn't want to rep it especially my city I'm from a small city called Paramount people there either want to rep Compton or they want to rep Downey okay. which are po- polar opposites I live in Long Beach city. for a long time so that's my perspective on Downey and shit <clears throat> we'd always be over there in Lakewood and exactly you know what I mean and like I don't think people are uh, uh shit south of Swifty Blue he, he's someone who rests Paramount Heavy. Man, Downey, like, I don't know. It's hard to get past the fact that the name of the city is, like, a derogatory nickname for a person with Down syndrome. Really? You know, I didn't know that. that. No. <laughs> well, you should not you call someone with, for, with Down syndrome. That's very, very rude. But when I was a kid, that was they, I would hear Down syndrome people called Downies. Really? I just thought it was, like, some d- detergent company. Well, that's another really good point. It yeah. just, it's a soft sound of name. But also, I'm sure there's crazy gangs out there, but it's not the hardest sound. And there's a lot of places in L.A. that kind of maybe have a bad part to it, but just have the reputation for being a pussy-ass place. You exactly, know? exactly. And uh, uh, fuck, what was I going to say? Um, no, nah, every, every city definitely got one. I mean, like Paramount, when I tell people I'm from there, they're like, oh, you mean Paramount Pictures? <laughs> I was like, no, bro. Yeah, so I was born there. <laughs> yeah, I was born in a fucking <laughs> in the, in the warehouse. Right. 
But uh, uh, no, I definitely want to rep my rep my side of town, bro. And I feel like every time I get a DM of some kid in like Southeast LA saying like, "Oh, I fuck with this, I do this," it's like, "Oh, that's exciting." Like I said, like all my desires are from that side of town. Mm. You know what I mean? And I love that. You know, because I, I really want to like show these kids that it's not just like being a rapper, or being some kid that works at a warehouse. Uh, you know, you could be creative and get paid for it. Here's it's how. dope though seeing how like you and Duno bringing in like a different fan base to No Jumper and shit where. Like, because if you live in L.A., you know that, like, a huge percentage, if you go to any kind of, like, hip thing, Supreme Drop, fucking uh, Tyler Creator, fucking store opening, a fucking uh, any rap concert or whatever. Anything. The fan base is a lot of times going to be, like, 80% Mexican kids. Like, yeah. it's just a gigantic percent of the population. And you and Duno are obviously, like, very different categories in terms of what you're doing and the type of dudes that you are. Yeah. But it's, like, I see the way that you guys are just, like, speaking to this fucking whole generation of exactly. kids, man. There, there's no one to do it. You know what yeah. I mean? And, like, I think maybe the last like three five years we're starting to see the representatives but i mean that that's a big portion of what i do it for for a while i didn't post my face on instagram or twitter so mm. like people didn't know what race i was you know what i mean and then i just started showing my face more i start realizing like these mexican kids specifically love that so you know what i mean i really want to rep them mm. do you feel rich do I feel rich? Can you just say, like, I'm rich objectively? Or do you feel like you're still, like, working to get to that point? Not necessarily because, like, every dollar I make, like, I, I you really? know, the money Sinking comes in, in. The money comes in every day, right? And, like, you know, it'll be thousands, 10,000 sometimes. But it's none of my, it's not my money. It's my business's money. Shit, right. some of it's the government's money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, I've I've already went through my, my honeymoon phase of money where it's, like, I'm seeing this shit, like, oh, I could do this, I could do that. Like, I now just see it as a business and, like... I gotta let this shit run, and like I'll 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 sync with my shit. You know, what I mean, I'm putting it almost every single dollar I'm getting back into the company. You ever have a moment where you got like a big ass check for the first time, and you just spent it all on some crazy shit? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm always gonna spend like no matter how much I make, I'll I'll probably spend like 10, 20 percent of it. You mm. know what I mean? But a majority of it though, like I know that I got, you know, it's around like ten thousand dollars. I got no, it's around like ten thousand dollars in just like rent and like office, mm. you know, like duties and shit like that that I had to make before I could turn a profit so like I don't even get excited you know what I'm saying it's like I remember the first like big six figure check I got and I was just like couldn't even think of one thing I wanted to do with it yeah and that's when I knew I was going to be a boring fucking person with money because I, I I remember I promised to myself that I wouldn't sleep on the floor anymore yeah so all those BMX trips over the years I'd always sleep on the floor like let the fucking right. pro riders sleep in the bed and shit mm -hmm. and I was like you know what from now on, I will get a separate room, and I will sleep in my bed. That's how I felt like two years ago with like spirit flights. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> From this moment on, no more spirit flights. Yeah, I finally conceded to my girl that I would fly first class with her, like because I've always really? just resisted it. I first class is cool. I never wanted to do it because I feel like it's fucking stupid. And it's too expensive. Hey, if you made, if you made, you know what I'm saying, so, so, some thousands that day. What, what's an extra sixty dollars? Like, fuck it. Yeah. I don't want. The, I don't want the. I don't want the liquor at the fucking. I just at the bar. I just want you know comfy, comfy seat for three hours. I, feel, I just have a scarcity mind state because like even when No Jumper started doing good, it was like I got a business manager, and then he basically reveals to me that like prior to No Jumper starting to do good, that my business situation was fucked up and my tax situation was fucked up. Yeah. So it's like even when I started to feel like I was getting money, it was like oh nah, like actually yeah you're gonna have to deal with this shit so it's like i still yeah. kind of have it in my head that it's like i don't want to get comfortable yeah you know jesus christ I, I was about to owe like hella money in taxes yeah you know what i mean but then i started sitting down with my tax guy we started realizing all the money we're investing mm. and it's not so bad but you know yeah i'm definitely not looking at money anymore as like you know i'll get i'll get some trophies you know what i mean like like the runs chain was a gift, but uh, this bank bob, like I'll buy it because I don't really be buying shit like that. You know mm. what I mean? But you know, I'm definitely not trying to buy Rolexes or you know what I mean. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to make sure that I have more than enough money with my business. So whenever I have an impulsive idea, I don't have to worry about like, do we have ten thousand for it or five thousand or whatever it is. Like, let's run it. This is it. Right. But do you, uh, uh, do you have a vision for retail? Like, is that something you're trying to do with your brands ever? Or? Eventually, I mean, like. Uh, I really want to do it with with these products because then I could buy way more. So let's say I could sell a thousand on my site, but I buy an extra two thousand to. But it's, I I need to hire somebody who does sales damn near mm. to like go into these fucking mom and pop uh you know like novelty spots where they sell dope shit you yeah. know like cos toys and all that bare bricks Spencer's 
Spencer shit. Hey, I feel like bro. Spencer's is gonna want you to sell that for like thirty bucks. I'm just saying, if Spencer's tapped, if I tapped in with Spencer, that's a mall shit that like, I I, I feel like I could change. You I think feel, you could make Spencer's lit? I'll try. If they don't want to do it, then they don't want to do it. Get rid of the fart powder and shit. Nah, <laughs> what do they got? Fart pills. We're doing extra <laughs> fart powder. We're doing fucking titty milk. Yeah. Uh, fucking powder, all that shit. Damn. I want to start buying Spencer's stock like the way they were buying GameStop. Yeah. Let me know. Spencer's was a whole wave when I was a kid. Bro, even even for me as well, you know, that, that that's some shit where you don't even need money to go in there and enjoy it. You just, like, you go with your friend, like, oh, look at this stupid-ass fucking dildo head. I got arrested shoplifting from a Hot Topic. Really? Well, halfway, kind of, because I had, like, stolen a bunch of shit from the Hot Topic, but then I went to Leechmere, which is, like, a department store at the same Leech mall. Leechmere? Leechmere. I know. It sounds insane, sounds right? Like a- <laughs> when I say it, I'm like, I can't even believe that this is a real fucking place I used to go to. But I went in there, and I think I stole a Nine Inch Nail CD and a White Zombie CD, <laughs> and then I was dipping out of there, and they caught me. You like Nine Inch Nails? I mean, I did at the time when I, I was I can 13. never get into it. Uh, it's not my fair band, but they, they had some hard shit. Really, you want to recommend me any songs? What was that one that Johnny Cash covered? I hurt myself today. Oh, hurt? <laughs> that, they covered her. Right? I definitely don't want to listen to Nine Inch Nails cover <laughs> hurt. <laughs> that was their song. That's not their song. Yes, it was. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. This world's a lie. That's fucked up, right? <laughs> Yo. Dude, Trent Reznor was a goat. I thought I thought this whole time Johnny Cash is the man. and I mean, he probably is, but I thought he made that song. That's crazy. When I was looking for houses, uh, the realtor pointed at this like house next to a house they were looking at, and she was like, uh, Gwen Stefani's ex-husband lives there. And I'm just like, you mean Gavin Rosdale from Bush? And she's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what damn, the, the game is fucked up. That like, if you're like Gavin <laughs> Rosdale's whole career erased because he's going to Stefani's ex. I, I've that's the first time I ever heard that name. Really? <laughs> oh, fuck. And I'm pretty like, but you know, Gwen Stefani. So yeah. See, she was talking to somebody. How old are you? 28. 27. 27. Yeah, man, I'm old here. No, nah, there, there's definitely some realtor clout chasers out you there. You never listen to Bush? <clears throat> no. Razor blade suitcase. No, I, I think like the what was this that? This guy. Like, if you want to talk about punk, I'll you know I was fucking with Seven Seconds. You know oh, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Um, I mean that's way more like real punk. Fucking Bush is like alternate, alternative fucking radio rock. Oh no, I wasn't listening to that shit. Uh, if it if it was metal like Chelsea Grin, fucking all, had a Slayer phase. Mm. You know what I mean? But how do you feel about people rocking shirts of bands they never heard? I don't really care for it. Could I, you I, do it? Yeah. You would? Because like I come from like. That I ain't gonna lie, like bro, like I, I used to, my homies were like, Oh, you can't wear this metal shirt. So I used to have to deal with that shit and I used to be like, This is stupid. Like it's weird because I wouldn't wear a metal shirt of a band I didn't know, but I'll I rock like a Fashion Nova fucking Mary J. Blige shirt on here. <laughs> and I have almost no Mary J. Blige knowledge. But you wouldn't wear like a Sayosin shirt or some shit like that? No. Cause <laughs> I actually know about that shit. Whereas like R and B, like me wearing a Mary J. Blige shirt, like everybody who sees me wearing that knows that it's like just a shirt to me. Yeah. It's like when you see like a seven year old kid rocking a Metallica shirt, you just know they never heard Metallica. I'll press the shit out of them. <laughs> Name five songs. Yeah, oh God. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Uh shit. Oh yeah. So we've talked in the past about having you help with no jumper on some shit like what what do you imagine that looking like like i don't because we want to sell a lot of like your brand and like other brands you're associated with in our new retail store that is coming soon i don't know it's like i i keep fucking thinking about this and i feel like we might as well have at least some of the conversation on camera right you're you're asking me like how do i fit like what would i envision yeah like all right because i mean it would be easy for us to just like stock some nothing personal shit on a consistent basis or even like this kind of shit like you know i think you should have like fucking a shitload of dealers but that would be definitely want to yeah even just that like for an example if we had that on the shelf i guarantee we'd be selling like dozens of them a week exactly well i mean first off i I feel like you know the t-shirt stuff is almost clockwork and like that all, all the printable stuff that's some shit that we could always just make some dope stuff but i really think that there's like a a bigger opportunity when it comes to I don't know like some of your guests you know if it makes sense for them yeah spark that if, if it makes sense for uh, uh for them to do some merch shit that was relevant to a conversation held on no jumper like there should definitely be some kind of merchandise for it mm. at least I feel you know what I mean like um you know fucking 
Kazumi comes or, or Sharp comes, and it's like, Sharp, we need to have your merch there. You know what I mean? We, we need to find some representation of you here at the store. You well, because I mean? that's something that Barstool does like an amazing job of is that the shit that they're talking about on the blog, on the podcast, et cetera, they just like at a moment's notice will have merch ready to go yeah. that like is of the jokes, their weird inside jokes or whatever. And that's one thing we have always kind of struggled with is like the podcast is one thing. A lot of times, if you look at like the Instagram, it doesn't even feel like it's like that related to the podcast because it's not like right. the same people that are on the podcast aren't on there and like the people who are yeah. in the office aren't necessarily on the Instagram and then when you look at the merch it's like we've had moments where we like harness like a viral moment on the show and turn it into merch and had to go crazy but we don't do that like that consistently yeah I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities I'm, I mean it feels like every other week there's you know there's a viral clip you know mm. what I mean and th there definitely should be some kind of a, a I mean because the fans want it they're gonna want to cop it you know they're, they're getting all their uh their no jumper list merch frustration out on Yuri and house phone you know mm. what I mean Cause it's like I want to I want to represent these guys and I want to fuck with them let me fuck with their brand you know what I mean let me buy merch from them but I think that there's a big opportunity for no jumper I could imagine like a content series where you're like talking to a rapper and designing their merch while you're just sitting there talking to them. I could do that. And the fans could like see your work as you're like putting shit down and having them talk about it and stuff. We I wonder what that would be like. We did that on 10 Talks. Actually, there was oh, somebody really? that was like pets pesky in the uh, comments saying like blazy ain't a real designer fuck that he just has designers and i was reading that shit and i'm like shit you got me fucked up really? we ended up making the shirt right there <laughs> live on camera have you done that on twitch are you scared to have people see your work like that oh no i i've the last three four weeks i went to ad's crib and that inspired me he started telling me numbers he started i started seeing the energy i'm like i gotta do this again i was doing it last summer but now it's like three times the viewers and i am designing i'm honestly just like fuck it most of these kids can't even they can't get these produced anyways it's very hard to make products like this or when it's t-shirts it's like i have confidence that like my audience is just gonna know the real and if it really comes down to it i got timestamps. you know what i mean but like i have designed a couple things and i already seen things got bootlegged really? you know, there's a weed bag that i designed on live and uh it's going viral now on twitter <laughs> you know what i mean i don't even want to i don't even want to uh, promote it but um damn you know does that bum you out when your shit gets bootlegged nah nah i love that shit but like it, it, it's a good reflection and it's a it's a it's a good temperature check of like where you're at in your career yeah. like is your shit still hot enough for somebody to be like fuck blazy i, I want some bread you 2014 I, mean? I saw a picture one of my friends went on bmx trip to mexico and they were in some random ass town and he just took a picture with like five kids that were all wearing bootleg on some shit shirts that's hard and i was fucking hyped yeah. slightly sad but not really because realistically like we just probably would not be able to like satisfy that market even if it was like a thing you know like i have no idea what prices they were paying yeah. but it's probably cheap enough that we just like would not be able to sell for those prices there. yeah well, well, well there's bootleg and then there's straight up just like replicas right like in a situation like that like you know especially with gucci or like runs you know what i'm saying where it's like at the end of the day if you approach somebody with a fake gucci bag or a fake runs they're still going to be like, oh, it's real Gucci. Oh, it's real runs. Yeah. They're still repping the brand. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And whenever people ask them, like, yo, you know, do you be rocking Gucci? Like, hell yeah, I'm rocking Gucci. They're still, like, co-signing it. You know what I mean? They're not saying necessarily I got it from this guy down the street. Some some might will, but majority of people just want to rep the brand. We got a cease and desist from Atlantic, I think, for doing a Kodak shirt. With I was going to ask him as you a about NASCAR that. Driver. I remember when that shit came out. But it was funny because I was with Atlantic at the time. So they like, like my guy mm. reached out to me and he was like, yo, can you take that off the off the site? Yeah. So we don't have to send you the season desist because they're going to send you a season desist. I've always wondered what happened with that shirt. That and the uh, the super radical Gucci main. I remember you said in Never the podcast that. that like Gucci ne bought yeah. one at one point. Gucci main bought one. Like a shirt from the site? I think somebody might have told me that, but I don't know if that's confirmed or not. But we also got a cease and desist from Gucci because we had a shirt we were selling that was like Gucci, like old school Gucci, and then like hella Gucci logos and shit. So it was mm. like the one thing that you never get, Very which is like days. a, yeah, exactly. Like it was like the old school Gucci on the merch, like the best era of like fat fucking super thugged out gucci and then like actual gucci print because he can that. he can never do that yeah. kind of shit because like i heard that he hears from the, their legal department all the time about shit or at least it used to be it, like that in his book he said that they tried to sue him but he was able to prove it that like he got his name from his uncle who's also called gucci right
which is pretty insane. When yeah, you think about then, it. Then he ended up collabing with them. Yeah, they, they had a whole mark. They all had a whole campaign a couple think, years ago. Didn't he have some angry ass tweets about them fucking with him at one point? I think maybe even have. after he collabed with them. Really? I don't know. Damn. Yeah, Gucci is hard. I'm like when I was interviewed bootleg Kev and he was talking about his past life as a bootlegger. There was just something that. about that that just sounded so fucking fun and cool to me. Yeah. Like the idea of like that's his whole nickname now. Yeah, and like he's still stuck with the nickname, but just the idea of like making a living off of just like taking advantage of like random ass corporations that you don't give a fuck about is right. just kind of badass to me. And I remember like at one point when we first did the store, we did like a bunch of like Walkhart hats and like Newport hats and Jesus. shit, and they were selling like fucking crazy. And it's just such a good feeling i think we even did backwards hats which sounds kind of lame now but like just selling the newport hats right. like crazy just seems like so sick like we're just making money off of this fucking shitty ass company that sells the worst cigarettes on earth well that's the thing most of those like you, you you'll come across like a round two or like a vintage store selling like marble shirts and it's just because in the the fact that like in the 90s something happened where they weren't allowed to make any merchandise right so like most of these drugs like you'll see like a <laughs> random like adivan shirt from like the 80s or so like a xanax shirt you right. know what i mean but like Drug drug content is definitely low hanging fruit that like is just gonna satisfy the market and be able to get your money off of and boom. I remember I used to kick it with this girl who had a shirt that <clears throat> had like a, a shirt for like a prison and saying like the official prison of the nineteen ninety eight Winter Olympics. Right. And it was like the most mind blowing vintage shirt I've ever seen. I'm just like, why the fuck did they make a shirt for that? Like, how is that a fucking thing? Who had access to these shirts? When I think about it now, maybe it was made by somebody who was like in on the joke. Yeah. Because that, dude, that's the kind of brand I always wanted to run is like a fucking bootleg brand. Yeah. Like, would do stuff like that. Like, make shirts that are like kind of believable. Right. But like fake and like just somehow get them out there without everybody being in on the joke. Honestly, there there should be a vintage reseller that just does that. Just gets dusty Goodwill blank shirts and just prints out like 1988 McDonald's thon in Virginia. You yeah. know what I mean? $200. Make, like the that's Marlboro a cool shit. Like, I used to fucking collect Marlboro miles off the ground when I was a kid. And then really? eventually I got a backpack. And then oh, that's right. They, they, I spent like my whole summer picking these shits up <laughs> off the ground when I was like 12. Damn. Riding my bike around just looking for Marlboro miles. <laughs> yeah, that's how they get the kids. Swisher got sued for because uh, c- their shit almost looked like Crayola. Crayola? Yeah. Swisher. Yeah. What? That's interesting. I would have to see it side it, by it was, side. They said it was just too colorful. They got like that that like envelope little design at the, in the front. Right. But uh, yeah, that happened. Swisher's, I think, bought, played paid product placement in a little baby verse oh i, I th- you I remember I that song where he said shout out switches sweets they keep me rolling yeah it was like recently too and i was like bro that right there is the promo that runs and backwards and everybody gets for free yeah and it felt like a fucking ad yeah because i don't think this fool smoke swishers how i've much, never seen it i could see swishers dropping a bag on that yeah because like how much money do you have to drop to make little baby give a fuck when he's getting like many hundreds of thousands <laughs> for a show you know is I think that should be the new marketplace. Like, like what if I could pay like little baby to promote my NFT in a bar? Like, bro, look, a hundred thousand dollars. Say this NFT, it got me rich. He has a fucking bored ape tattoo on his neck. <laughs> oh, he fucking he does. does that was fucking like, no way that's real. Because when you think about what the bored apes are doing, they're just like an NFT that is really making strides and doing things to keep it in the conversation yeah. and to keep people convinced that it's gaining value. And I think Lil Baby is somebody that they probably gave him hella NFTs and probably cash up front too to just fully get behind the project super early. And he is like a big factor in making it cool. Or like think about that Eminem one that they did. Like you know Eminem got paid out the ass to yeah. fucking promote that and be openly presented. Unsur- with that. Unsurprised no NFT like billionaire found like the the budget enough for drake to mm. be like guys this is my fucking bored owls maybe drake just found that to be like one line he didn't want to cross right. in terms of doing I can something corny because like drake imagine how much money he gets from that fucking steak thing yeah he probably make i heard they pay uh aaron ross four million dollars a month oh my god which is an ungodly sum and, and that's the interesting thing because apparently internet uh like you cannot it has to be like an out of like out the country uh company for it's it like to run crypto thing, yeah. yeah i don't think you could uh, uh you have to like have a vpn or something if you want to be in the united states to use their shit i'm pretty sure it's the same thing as that steve will do it rubet shit that yeah like we we did that shit promoted it too 
Well, I'm pretty sure they just like rebranded and got Aiden Ross and Drake to promote it. There's so much money in that shit, but I think <coughs> I think we I think we saw the end of the bubble. I'm gonna keep it real. Did you dabble in the NFT space? Every time I tried to, it just felt like ugh, there's no reason to drop one. Every mm. time I try to learn some shit, it's just like they're stupid, like lingo. They 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 really try to make it hard for you not to understand what they're talking about. It's almost mm. like pimp talk. It's like 99.9% .9 of them are total garbage. And for me, it's like really hard to imagine how I could present it to the audience and make it seem authentic and genuine. Like Cole dropped the Lyrical Lemonade one. Right. But he didn't, he didn't post about it that much. Yeah. So I wonder... I don't know. And I, I could see him, like, he's obviously someone so worried about his brand. I, I could <laughs> yeah. see him, like, taking the steps, making sure that this is bulletproof and mm. this will honestly, like, you know, this will benefit somebody or maybe it's a business opportunity for people. I mean, by him, like, under-promoting it, I feel like that kind of, like, helps keep the expectations low. Yeah. Because a lot of companies are just making it sound like this is going to be the next great gold rush. Maybe that should be the marketing campaign. Just like hire an influencer to like kind of like low key, just maybe like like a photo of it. Right. You know what I mean? But or it's interesting because it's like if Cole drops NFTs right now, that means he was probably like working on the idea fucking six months ago. Yeah, you for know? sure. And I guarantee that his vision of what nfts were going to turn into is different now at this point than it was six months ago whether it's right. like a big difference or a little difference you know myself six months ago i like really saw the vision with nfts and we bought that punk and i'm oh you bought a crypto punk yeah we spent oh. 160k on it do do you do you feel like it worked out well there was a while where it was fucking like 450k i haven't had the balls to look in a while but i'm pretty sure the floor is significantly lower now and i think i'm just like down to like go down with the ship with it like if i see them start selling for 20k i'm just yeah. gonna be like you know what <clears throat> fuck it let's if just let's hold this thing forever and yeah. maybe in 20 years it'll be worth something close to what we paid but at least i have a stake in it even though it's but not you do, a lot you do have those examples like the uh the jack dorsey tweet right where yeah. uh, where it, it shoots down to like seventy dollars <laughs> or twelve dollars, yeah. you bought it for a couple of M's. Well, but I, like, I heard it was like ten k. It ended up being yeah. Like, but at one point lower. it sold for three million. Yeah, but I, I think that like at least the crypto punks and the board eight that that's honestly like artifacts for like internet history. Yeah. You know, what I mean, if there's anything that's like a good, you know, it's probably gonna be good in sixty. That's something that I could see. Like, okay, if there was this weird internet thing from sixty years ago, like today, like. There's going to be a market for people who just want to collect them. There was an artist that we were going to do some designs with. He was just like a really dope graphic designer. And we met with him, talked with him, seemed cool. And then like a couple months later, I remember and I asked Jason, I'm like, yo, like, did we ever get any designs from that dude? And Jason's like, yo, honestly, like he started going hard with the NFT shit. And I guess he's making so much money off that that he really like is not even doing shirt designs for people now. And I wonder if that guy is doing shirts again, because <laughs> I kind of <laughs> wonder like how big that market is for it's that like, shit. It, it, I mean, there's just different bubbles and opportunities. You saw at the beginning of COVID with the drop shipping companies, people were seriously making six, seven figures off of it. And yeah. then it's like, where are they at now? You know, do people want this many fucking K91 masks or whatever it was? You know what I mean? Mm. But uh, it, 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 that's just that's just the thing about I guess being an internet entrepreneur. You just gotta like know when to like latch onto you know a, a, a wave and you know leave at the right time. It yeah. happened for stocks, you know, right before the NFT market. In my opinion, yeah, people just became stock experts around the time GameStop started popping up or Pokemon card experts. Right, you saw a lot of people who were like washed up doing other things just become Pokemon experts or NFT aficionados yeah. or Game Stock pumpers. I don't think you're, you're you're you I don't think you're the biggest YouTuber until you really go behind the NFT. I think that's like really what like stamps uh like a big YouTuber. But it's crazy because like that Lana Rhodes shit, like she's been getting called a scammer left I, and right. I saw the Kylie Zilla video, it was like crazy. And my girl was gonna do the same deal. Really? And she was like, I think I can make like half a million or some shit. And I was like, do not do it. Like you just yeah. don't want to be associated with that shit. She's gonna get called a scammer, yada yada, and then that exact thing happened, and Lana Rose got called out for her super hard. But the thing that you gotta respect is all the people like Soldier Boy and all these. I know shitloads of porn star girls were promoting crazy NFT shit and probably made hella hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars off it. 
and it's trash. They're not tweeting about it anymore. They made bags off it, and they didn't really incur that much of a social penalty because it's like CoffeeZilla can only make videos about so many people. Like right. the shit that he made videos about Steve will do do it doing or the, the Save the Kids thing or whatever. It's like those are just the ones that were big enough for it to those be worth highlights. him catching. You know, it's like so many people. Like I remember when Soldier Boy was just selling every single tweet of his ever. <laughs> he probably made a fuckload of money off right. that, and nobody even fucking remembered members yeah I, I really think a part of it is just the way you handle the uh the prosecution like someone like ice poseidon was like he was yeah. so he, he was so like man fuck it Ugh. you know he, d he did the fucking yeah. shoulder thing you know but lana Rhodes, i think her biggest downfall is just like the the way it ended of her saying like oh no this isn't that you know what i mean and her just saying like well you can't judge me for this but she's also an easy target in a way that my girl yeah. my girl probably wouldn't have got as much shit because she's not as big and she just wouldn't like have gotten the same level of attention on her she might have been able to skate on it you know yeah and also like lana Rhodes, people are already prepped to hate her because she like has repented for right. her porn past exactly. and like you know like i don't know just something about her or the shit with mike and like people just look at her she and they, got some enemies they want to hate on her so yeah. like she was just an easy target for that shit you know facts mm. man gang bro uh shit anything else we should talk about um i'm getting hungry man me too uh shit thank you so much for you know including me into the disconnected crew i'm excited man yeah no I, i'm definitely excited and i'm glad that i'm finally a part of it you know it was definitely uh, uh fun to to finally do this shit you know firsthand like i said i've been watching this shit since like 2015 so yeah i appreciate it man i'm glad we got to finally dig into your mind and yeah learn what's going on got man. some good time two and a half hours jesus had to do it oh yeah we in there we spoke on it we spoke on it. Let's Squoke. squeak on it. Yeah, let's squeak on it. Blasi. Hell yeah. Appreciate you, man. Nothing personal. Let's do it. No jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, all that shit. Nojumper.com if you want to support. Like, comment, subscribe. Bang, bang. Peace.